Dr. Monica knows me. Uh, so we have heard you, madam. We have heard you before. Okay, thank you. Thank Good evening, ma'am. Good evening. Okay, Priyanka, can we start now? Ma'am, program will be live in uh, just few seconds. Yeah, sure. Monica knows me. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. We are live now. Yeah. Good. Good evening, all respected faculties. and delegates i welcome you all on the behalf of public awareness committee foxy with south zone for the episode 6 of core connect live webinar i invite all the respected faculties and delegates to join together for lightning the lamp and let's take the name of the god thank you all yes. coordinators for the today's event are dr monica umbardan and dr shatabdi de dr monica umbardan is consultant uh, of ops yeah, and dining let it be don't introduce let it be okay ma'am uh, in, in short uh, i'll introduce myself and shatabdi as conveners and coordinators for this program Uh, I welcome all the esteemed faculty for the sixth episode of the Public Awareness Committee Zonal Webinars. This webinar is with all the South Zone societies, and the theme for our webinar today is Cervical Cancer Prevention and Vaccination. This is in accordance with the theme of our President Rishikesh Pai sir, because our focus is on non-communicable diseases this year. To, uh, to carry this forward we have organized this so that we can carry the message to all the faculty is as well as the delegates in every nook and corner of india about vaccinations screening methods and the conservative management of ca service uh, we hope to give a lot of take home messages to our delegates who are online Uh, I also take privilege in introducing Dr. Priyanka Roy as the chairperson of Public Awareness Committee. These webinars are a brainchild of his. Welcome, Dr. Priyanka. He is a chairperson of uh, the Public Awareness Committee and a consultant at in of in infertility and diabetes at Nova IVF. Yes, uh, I request you uh, to welcome all the faculties and introduce Aswath Sir as the guest of honor for this webinar. Thank you, Monica. Good evening, everyone. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome all of you to this uh, yet another public awareness committee program uh, with the South Zone uh, societies today. We are indeed privileged to have so many delegates joining us for the programs across the country. And as of now, we have had almost two thousand five hundred plus delegates who have joined us for our programs all round. First of all, I would like to thank and welcome our. Uh, President Foxy, Dr. Rishikesh Pai sir, Secretary General Dr. Madhuri Patel, ma'am, Vice President Dr. Alka Pandey, and our uh, National Coordinator and the immediate past chairperson Dr. Kalyan Bhamar. So for today's program, uh, Dr. Bharti Rajshekar and Dr. Raghavendra Prasad, welcome. Chief guest today, Dr. Rishikesh Pai sir, will be joining us in some time. A guest of honor for today's program, Dr. Ashwath Kumar sir and Dr. Anjali Lakshmi, ma'am, welcome to this program. we have expert speakers for this session and we have dr leela digumati ma'am thank you ma'am for joining us in spite of your busy schedule we have our esteemed chairpersons dr ramani devi ma'am and dr dina baburaj ma'am with us today thank you so much for joining and we have two exciting panels on cervical screening and vaccination and another one on modalities of conservative surgical management of ca cervix to moderate the panels we have dr bharti rajshekar ma'am and dr aruna kumar ma'am and dr raghavendra prasad and dr kiran mai will uh, moderate the second panel uh, expert today's session are dr sarina gilbas ma'am and the other panel the expert is dr manjula anandani ma'am the best experts that you can think of for a pan for a panel on this topic 
Our panelists today, Dr. Geeta, Dr. Prabha Desai, ma'am, Dr. Lata Chaturvedala, ma'am, Dr. Chandra Ponuswami, ma'am, Dr. Rupa Prakash, ma'am, Dr. Amrita, ma'am, Dr. Padmaja, and Dr. Achana Singh, ma'am. Welcome to this uh, session. I would also like to thank the panelists for the next session, Dr. Sheshaya, Dr. Mala, Ma Maya Malaya, Dr. Sunita, Dr. Sandhya Rani, Dr. Ramya, Dr. Mariam, Dr. Swati, and Dr. Aparna to this session. So welcome, everyone. And I would also especially like to thank and welcome the coordinators for today's session, Dr. Monica Umbardhan and Dr. Sasati. Welcome. Now, the driver is not I would, I would now like to welcome our guest of honor for today's session, Dr. Ashwat Kumar, sir. Dr. Ashwat, as we all know him, is another stalwart of Foxy, has done so many programs for Foxy, and especially the best part with him is he conducts so many postgraduate training program of which I have been a part of most of his programs and totally love this program. He is an expert laparoscopic surgeon, and he is also a professor and unit and professor in the department of OBGYN at the, at the Jubilee Mission Medical College in Tissue. He has been a past vice president of Foxy. He is, has been awarded a number of awards and currently he is also the president of the Kerala Federation. Welcome, sir. It's a pleasure to uh, have with us requesting a few words of thank encouragement. You. Uh, th thank you, uh, Priyangur. And it is uh, respected Rishigesh Pai, sir, uh, Madhuri Patel, madam. Uh, Alka Pande, madam, uh, and uh, Priyankur, and uh, today's coordinators, Monica and Sadapti. And uh, thank you, uh, Priyankur, for inviting me. Any program, uh, Priyankur is my student, as well as he is my uh, team. In every program I conducted, Priyankur is a part of it. So uh, it's nothing like uh, he's calling something to his house, I feel. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, and uh, thank you, Monica, for reminding me and uh, making sure that I am there. Uh, as a guest of honor in time. And we have coordinators, Bayardi, Dr. Bayardi and Dr. Raghavendra Prasad, and uh, my co-guest of honor along with me, Anjalakshi, madam, sitting with the senior madam as a co. It's a proud privilege for me. And you have excellent speakers and chairperson and moderators, all by been introduced by Priyangur. And the topic we have selected is cervical cancer. See, um, it is a preventable cancer. We all know that it is the, uh, even if whatever we do next to breast cancer, even now the incidence of cervical cancer in India is high. So to prevent it, it's very important. So the one of the most important part is the screening and the guidelines, which everybody should know. We are aware that it should be screened in time, but we many of us don't know how it is screened, what are the methods used, all they will be highlighted by experts in the first session. And the second session, when you say uh, surgical management, uh, most of the people know management of CS cervix means either radical hysterectomy or uh, radiotherapy. Uh, that is what they think, chemo radiation. But uh, there are so many, the importance of, uh, many of don't know the importance of conservative surgical uh, methods which can be used to treat in the early stages. So one is early detection and the early stages, how it can be managed without any morbid surgeries or radiotherapy, which has many common complications. So excellent topic with excellent panel. It's all the names have been taken. So we all respect all respected panelists and experts and moderators are there. So without any delay, I know that I'm telling all the best for Priyangur for his committee and his activities. I love to be anytime when he calls to come for his activity. And I would have, if time permitted, I would have been a part of his panel. And uh, because uh, cancer oncology is something I also love to practice. So uh, thank you so much Priyangur. Thank you Foxy for inviting me for this program and thank you Monica also. So thank you. All the best for the program. Thank you Priyankur. Thank you sir. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for your words of encouragement sir. Thank you so much. Over to you Monica. Thank you sir. So, thank you for your words of encouragement. Uh, I now request uh, Satabdi to introduce our next guest of honor Anjalashmi ma'am. A very good evening to everyone. Uh, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce our next uh, guest of honor, Dr. Anjal Lakshi Chandrasekhar, ma'am. Uh, ma'am is the founder president of TNFOG. She has been the past president of Oxy as well as the past president of Dipsy. She is a PhD in, in pregnancy diabetology from the Tamil Nadu MGR Institute. And she also has been the recipient of the best doctor award from I IMA. 
she has multiple publications and she has been examiners in various exams she is one of the stalwarts in our field we uh, welcome you anjalakshmi ma'am and we would like to hear a few words of encouragement from you please thank you ma dr sadapti good evening to everyone dear president poxi dr rishikesh pai the secretary general dr madhuri patel dr alka pandey vice president dr priyankur roy the chairperson public governance committee poxi and dr kalyana uh, kalyan the past chairperson public awareness committee national coordinator and coordinators dr monica and dr sadapti and um, my dear delegates my friend dr ramani and my uh, dear faculties I, uh, i am bringing warm greetings to all of you it is my great privilege and happiness to be the guest of honor for this wonderful webinar episode 6 series on cervical cancer i congratulate the public awareness committee of foxy and the south zone societies for arranging this wonderful cme and uh, foxy is doing a novel uh, performance of creating a public awareness not only public awareness and also awareness in the medical fraternity to uh, give their best uh, uh services to our women folk so with advances in the technology and science there are advancement in the diagnostic tools and therapeutic modalities which we have to update ourselves and uh, the cervical cancer is such an important topic and this is the only cancer we can get uh, the 100% cure and prevention and 100% we can prevent the disease also it is considered to be the third generation sexually transmitted disease with the proper screening prophylactic vaccine and early diagnosis the can cancer clearance which will help the women to have a 95 to 100% survival rate and uh, dear delegates you are going to listen to a talk on the guidelines of cervical cancer screening which is a very important tool to for the prevention and also two beautiful and informative panels on cervical screening vaccination and uh, the modalities on the conservative surgical management once the disease occurs so i request all delegates to learn the advancements and offer better service to our fellow women i wish the webinar a grand success and the also once again thank for this wonderful opportunity jai hind hello thank you so much yes. ma'am yeah over to you yeah. monica yeah. ma'am thank you so much for your kind words of encouragement mm -hmm. i would now reintroduce uh, rishikesh pai sir as the chief guest for this webinar sir has just joined um obviously can we have the slide please sir thank you for joining us and uh, being a constant source of inspiration for all of us for being a part of all our webinars so uh, in a short, in short let me take pride in inviting you and introducing you for this webinar Hello. sir is a medical director of loom ivf he is the current president elect foxy he is Hello. also the administrator Yes, sir. Doesn't matter, madam. I'm not president. Like I'm the president of Foxy. It's the whole slide. Doesn't matter. Sir, it's the whole slide. Sir, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Just I'll. Yeah. So thank you, Priyankur, uh, the public awareness committee. Priyankur is a very dynamic person. You know, very. Uh, he was in Vatog, and now he's a dynamic chairman. Uh, and we have we are looking forward to a lot of great things from him in the future. And. i can see uh, dr Ma madhuri patel i don't know whether she is there alka pandey ji and kalyan barmade who are the other people in charge and now uh, i think they are doing this with the south zone and i can see our padmashri manjula aglani is there the great laparoscopic surgeon and dr monica oberban uh, dr day dr rajshekar is there dr raghavendra prasad dr ashwat dr anjalakshi and then uh, ramni devi i can see who is a great endometriosis person dr baburaj and uh, dr digmati and many many other people bharti raj sekar is already i can see so anyway basically uh, you know there are like when, as you become foxy president uh, then you start getting more knowledge and so as you you know they call you just today i got another who invitation so that's the advantage of being the president because the federation is a very powerful 
organization at present. It's respected all over the world. Nothing to beat the Federation. That's why everyone wants to become the Foxy president. But even the other people who are there in the Federation, there's a huge amount of opportunity. So if I understand what the world is heading towards, the two most important things they are look interested in worldwide, WHO, or all the other organizations, aid organizations, funding organizations. There are five areas of health, malaria, tuberculosis, contraception, maternal health, and cancer. These are the five areas the people fund. Funding areas, funding people are big. You, by the way, the Gates Foundation is located in Seattle. Uh, they have 1,700 employees. Do you know what is the money allocated to all these five things by the Gates Foundation? It's $9 billion. That's the money. The MSD for Mothers, which helps us in the Manyata program, they have a fund of $500 million. The Gates Foundation has a fund of $9 billion. So all the things that uh, vaccines, climate change. So in the area of women's health, there are two important areas they are focused on at present. The world is focused on these two important areas. One is maternal mortality rate following childbirth. That is because of three things. One is the TPH, second is the sepsis, third is the hypertension. So presently the focus is on PPH. That's why as Foxy president, I was called to the Dubai meeting or the, the new PPH guideline, the old guideline was done in 2012. The new guideline is coming in 2014. So when the Dubai meeting, 160 people they had called. All the researchers, etc., 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 at the bottom were the association. I was, by grace of God, called on the steering committee, which is made up of 14 people. And then they have divided this into four parts. First is the research. Second is the advocacy. Third is the guideline committee and fourth is the implementation committee. I have been put in the guideline committee. The timeline for creating the new PPH guideline is 2024. The second part of the world is obsessed by is the cancer. So the cervical cancer is their ob second obsession because mortality rate on non-pregnant women is from cancer. So obviously cervical cancer is the big another big baby as far as funding agencies are concerned whenever they look at any area they look at it from four aspects research guideline awareness advocacy and implementation and scalability so they will give a project to india for example they will analyze it in say bihar but they will sanction a project which can be applied to africa also it can be applied to Europe also. So scalability and application is always seen when the projects are being done. Just giving you information, what I've learned as a as I evolve my life, as I go up the ladder, what I have learned from them and where we should focus our energy is, is important. As far as the cancer, as far as my philosophy of cancer is concerned, I believe in integration, ekikaran. So I would not look at cervical cancer alone. I look at breast cancer. Uterine cancer, vulvar cancer, colonic cancer, ovarian cancer, or a holistic. Holistic is important. What is the use of just being cervical cancer? You know, I remember when I was young, one of the doctors, the patient said to the doctor, they, he examined me, delivered me, but she had a very big fungating breast because no one looked at the breast anyway. Throughout the antenatal, no one looked at the breast. So the fungating breast, I remember, and she died also. So, when you look at a person, look at him in a holistic way, you know. And it's so simple. Na? I can, you can summarize cancer in four lines. What the big deal? Just examine a breast, do a mammography every two years if you have got the access, do a per abdomen and do an abdominal scan, do a cervical visual examination of cervix, do a pap smear, maybe if you have got money, do an HPV test and do an occult blood of stools. And the new technology that is coming up is a leakage of the cells into the maternal circulation. It is a NGS, just like NIPT. There's a new test where you can analyze the cell leakage and do screen for 10 cancers. 
with that and that's becoming better and better they are becoming better so the micro rna analysis dr ramni they will be happy because she does a micro rna test she has done in endometriosis so this micro rna analysis is going to be the next thing so you will be able to pick up the cancer before actually so you can say okay there is a cancer somewhere in the spleen let us look at that organ in more detail so early detection obviously and one of the great authors you uh, noah harari has said that the longevity of women will go to 150 years because you will be able to so the three things that cause death in all of us is diabetes hypertension cardiac disease and cancer that's how we will die so if we can pick them up prevent them and prolong we are going to prolong our lives so this is the new exciting field so as far as the cancers are concerned by micro rnas or ng Yes, on leak DNA from cancer cells before they get clinically manifested is the way to go, and that test is round the corner already. One uh, lab is offering it for fifteen thousand rupees a year. It can pick up ten cancers, but it will become better and better, more refined and more accurate. And I'm sure within five years' time, it will be a routine test, just like the NIPT has become cheap and routine. So thank you very much for calling me, Priyankur, and all wish you all the best and. It's an exciting time for all of us. I am also excited all the time. Since morning, I'm working. I'm on the computer. So many meetings. Just now, I was called by the government for as analysis of the Lakshya program. So I learned so much. You know, they have appointed a UNICEF agency which is looking at the Lakshya. How do they do it? What are the parameters they set? How is the analysis done? That's a learning process for me also, because we are not exposed to all this. We are clinicians. So this is all a very exciting. time for all of us including me thank you very much priyankur all the best to you thank you so much sir it's a pleasure indeed for us and encouraging every time you join our program sir it means a lot to us please do uh, we will invite you for all our programs and we would love if you are there for all of them sir thank you so much for your work thank, thank you. you monica over to you thank you sir and thank you priyankur i now declare that the inauguration of this webinar as over and we now carry forward our academic session the first academic session uh, is uh, a talk by dr leela digu marthi ma'am i would request the chairpersons ramni madam and jina ma'am to join the session abhishek can we have the slides please the first chairperson is ramni madam madam is the managing director of ramkrishna medical center llt and the janani fertility center She has already won ten gold medals during her UG. Monica, uh, just introduce me as yes, past VP for uh, Foxy. That's all. Mm. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am has been the past vice president of Foxy, but madam is the most approachable uh, person as um, the post holding I've seen because I, we worked uh, under the public awareness committee in environment programs. Ma'am, welcome you to this session uh, as a chairperson. The next chairperson is Jena Ma'am. She is a consultant uh, at Vodafone. She is a chairperson of Oncology Committee KFOG, and she is a Kerala State Coordinator of the Oncology Committee Foxy. She is also on the editorial board of ISCCT, and she is a recognized corporate trainer for the same. She is also the past president of Vodafone Gynec Club. We welcome both of you to chair this session by Dr. Leela Dilumarthan. over to you ramnina yeah first of all let me thank the pack committee for uh, having included me in this uh, wonderful program on cancer screening and cancer awareness now it is my great opportunity to welcome dr leela dikumarthi who is a gynecological oncologist from kims icon hospital vaishal and uh, she is the president of indian society of colposcopy and cervical pathology certified colposcopic trainer by iss isccp member of isccp foxy agoi ims isopar igcs and isgo and she is a dnb teacher and examiner over a, a period of uh, more than a decade and she is an organizing secretary for isccp 2019 national conference which was held at vaishak uh, since 2014 with several ngos she has been interested in creating awareness regarding vaccination screening for cancer cervix uh, uh, con by conducting regular camps in 
North Andhra and master trainer for several colposcopic workshops across India. I think as on date, cancer cervical screening is the most important one. As we know already, the incidence of cancer cervix is on the decline because of our wonderful uh, screening projects. I think it, we should, it should be made available for everybody. See, like in Tamil Nadu, every, uh, there has been a mobile units for cancer cervical screening and the uh, ANMs are even trained how to do a visual examination of the cervix by just applying this um, uh, um, um, uh, iodine and then further they are referred to the higher centers or the taluk centers where they can undergo colposcopy and then treatment also. I think by doing this, we can uh, definitely pick up the patients who are potential candidates for having cancer cervix at a much earlier stage and we can prevent them. Now let us let us hear from the great speaker how we should go about regarding the guidelines for cancer screening. Welcome Dr. Leela. Yeah, thank you very much, madam, for your uh, nice introduction. Uh, good evening, uh, as chairpersons, esteemed faculty. And at the outset, I thank the Public Awareness Committee of FOXI for uh, inviting me to be part of this wonderful uh, webinar. And I'm really touched the way the, the guests and uh, our president have spoken about importance of uh, screening and how to uh, evolve understanding the latest concepts and other things. So with this, I will try to spend the next 30 minutes of my understanding about uh, cervical cancer screening. And then from then onwards, you can have uh, uh, the questions if I'm not clear in any aspect, and then we can move forward for panel discussion. So will you please allow me to share my screen? Shall I say, share my screen? Yes, sir. Yes, please, ma'am. Yes, ma'am, your screens are visible. Just yes. Yeah, okay. So in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to talk about cervical cancer screening guidelines. Basically, I have taken the material from our own FOXI guidelines of GCPR made in 2018 and 2021 WHO guidelines. I have not put any other guidelines just to have a, a clarity. I don't want to confuse by talking about too many guidelines. So you are all familiar with this picture. That is uh, uh, the WHO global uh, call for cervical cancer elimination which was done in May 2018. So we know that one woman dies of cervical cancer every two minutes. Each one is a tragedy and we can prevent it. So everybody in this uh, 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 meeting today and those who are attending the meeting are also are aware that cervical cancer is a preventable cancer. So through cost-effective evidence-based interventions, including HPV vaccination of girls, screening and treatment of uh, pre-cancerous lesions and improving access to diagnosis and treatment of invasive cancers, we can eliminate cervical cancer as a public health problem and make it a disease of the past. So that is all, that is the background on which we are all working towards elimination of cervical cancer. So again, this is uh, known to almost everybody. This has become a common word now that is global strategy towards elimination of cervical cancer. What are the WHO global targets set for 2030? That is 90, 70, 90. Even if somebody is woken up in the sleep, also are able to say now 90, 70, 90. So everybody knows about 90% of girls to be vaccinated by the time they reach 15 years of age. 70% of women have to be screened with a high precision uh, test at least twice in their lifetime, that is at the age of 35 and 45. And 90% of women identified with cervical disease have to receive treatment and care. <clears throat> so this global call for elimination, which was started in 2018, finally came into uh, a, a global uh, call in 2020. And we have already completed two anniversaries and we are moving towards the third anniversary. It is not just celebrating the anniversaries, but we should all aim to reach these global targets and the time left for us is the next seven years. So to reach these percentages. 
So how are we going to reach these percentage? And first of all, why should we aim to reach these percentages? That's what we have to know. So if you go into the global burden of cervical cancer, we know it is the leading cause of mortality all over the world in women. In 2020, all over the world, there are about 604,000 women who were diagnosed with new cases of cervical cancer worldwide and 342 women died from this disease. It is still the most commonly diagnosed cancer in 23 countries and leading cause of cancer death in 36 countries. So if you see this picture, you will understand uh, the scenario of the world. <clears throat> so only in Australia, you are seeing the lightest uh, teal color. Whereas in Africa, you are, and even in the South Asia, you are seeing a darker end of the teal color. Whereas in the developed countries, we are seeing a, a, a color range between the lightest teal to the darkest. So that means that really there is a lot of burden globally uh, about cervical cancer and all of us have to work together for elimination of cervical cancer. Then coming to the Indian scenario, it is the second most common cancer in women, especially in rural women after the uh, breast cancer. In 2020, according to Global Can statistics, it accounted for 9% of all cancers and 18.3% of new cases. Even though there is a reduction in the age standardized incidence rate in the last three decades, but if you really go into our population-based cancer registries, it is still the leading cause of death in 12 states, which I'm going to show in the next slide. So this is from the population-based cancer registries of India, where you see a lot of cancers of cervix happening in uh, northeastern states of India, uh, whatever may be the reason. And of course, in uh, some of the urban metropolitans, the breast cancer is number one and the cervical cancer is number two. So if you see here in this picture, you will understand these are the northeastern uh, states of, Andhra, uh, of uh, uh, our country where you see a very, very high incidence of cervical cancer. So uh, this is these slides will give us an idea what is actually the burden of cervical cancer. So the incidence varies uh, in different parts, even in our own country. It can be as high as 27.7 per 100,000 women to as low as 4.8 per 100,000 women. So if you go to the Dibruga district, the incidence is quite low. When you go to Pampupare district, the incidence is quite high. So it's a quite variable incidence of cervical cancer. So how to uh, eliminate it? So if you broadly divide the elimination strategies, we know the primary prevention by HP vaccination, which I'm not going to touch. So the next step is secondary prevention. For that, the first step for secondary prevention is screening, which I'm going to cover. I'm not going to touch upon the diagnosis or uh, probably a little bit about treatment where we use the screen and uh, treat approaches. So my main focus for uh, the talk in the evening today is uh, uh, screening. So what are the screening strategies and what are the guidelines? So going back to the uh, exact topic, we are all familiar with what are all the screening tests that are available to us. So originally we were talking a lot about visual inspection with acetic acid. Even Ramani Madam has stressed a lot about VIA and Willy, which really have uh, done a lot in some states of uh, India to reduce the incidence of cervical cancer. Then of course the uh, Peponicola smear, that is the cytology. Then coming to the molecular testing, that is the high-risk HPV DNA testing. So in the latest WHO guidelines, the order is uh, towards HPV as the first screening test to the cytology, to the visual inspection. It doesn't mean that all of us would be in a position to do this high-risk HPV DNA. So we are going to see how uh, a different screening tests that are available to us can be utilized in our day-to-day -day practice. So coming to our FOXI GCPR, and all of us are familiar with uh, these guidelines, how to choose the most appropriate screening test according to our practice. So in all, uh, almost all teaching hospitals, uh, they do a lot of cytology. Even we were all trained to do a lot of cytology. So if you have a cytology as a screening technique, and if your lab meets the quality of uh, indicators for the cervical cytology, 
you can still continue with that till your hospital or your institute or your state is ready to move on to HPV testing. Suppose if you don't have a cytology-based screening, whether you have a facility, the funding or whatever it is to move towards HPV testing. So if you have, you can move that. If you don't have that, if you cannot, if you cannot afford to move to any of these uh, uh, screening techniques, you can be still uh, continuing doing your VIA test, which is again a uh, time-tested test in Indian scenario. <clears throat> so if you are familiar with VIA, you have a good quality control over v your VIA screening test, you can still continue doing it. So this is how you can choose the appropriate uh, screening test for your practice. Uh, then after that, uh, our FOXI again has recommended the available screening test based upon uh, our resources. So if you uh, have a good resource setting and if you have a HPV testing, you can do a primary HPV testing or you can do a co-testing both with cytology and HPV. If you uh, don't have HPV testing, if you have a cytology, you can still continue, as I said earlier, with a good quality uh, indicators. And then it's not just doing a test. If somebody has a positive test, we should be able to do colposcopy and biopsy. And the other modality is visual inspection with acetic acid as a screening. Then the target age group in good resource setting is between 25 and 65. Cytology can start at the age of 25, whereas primary HPV testing or co-testing is at 30. We know the reason because we want the natural clearance of HPV to happen. So if we do HPV before 30 in a general population, we'll end up doing unnecessary uh, further investigations and other things except, and we, won't, we will be creating a lot of anxiety to women. So we want the natural clearance of HPV to happen. And for that reason, we wait, uh, we have put a cutoff of 30 to start doing HPV as a primary screening test. So if you, you are using HPV or co-testing, then the screening interval is once in five years. If you are using only cytology, the screening interval is three years. So if you are working in a limited resource setting, if you don't have any of these, you can uh, very comfortably continue doing uh, visual inspection with acetic acid. So uh, when you, you are doing VIA, I don't know whether uh, uh, the same setting will have a facility to have a colposcopy. But if you don't have, if you have a referral pattern from a primary to a district hospital, VIA positives, if you are not following the screen and treat approach, or if it is not possible to do screen and treat approach, you can always refer to a higher center for colposcopy and biopsy. So the recommended age group for uh, the screening for general population with VIA is 30 to 65. Of course, there are some problems of uh, screening uh, postmenopausal women with VIA, especially after the age of 55 when the transformation zone goes in. So when you are using VIA as a screening test, the recommendation by our FOXI is uh, uh, every five years. So this is a resource-based uh, cervical cancer screening recommendations. And again, our FOXI also has recommended when to stop screening. So we say blanket 30 to 65 years. So uh, according to this uh, GCPR, if you, are, if you are working in a good resource uh, setting, 65 with consistent negative results in the last 15 years. And of course, there are changes happening in all these um, uh, recommendations. So women with no prior screening. So some of us usually uh, get a chance to screen a woman at the age of 55 or 60 or 65. They would not have had screening at any time before. So in that situation, you can still do a, a screening test, even if you see a woman at the age of 64 or 65. So that can be done. And especially when you go for camps, you do see a lot of uh, elderly women coming because they would come for some other reason for medication or something like that. And you can use that as an opportunity to screen uh, for breast as well as for uh, cervical cancer. So follow-up method after treatment, which I'm going to, I'll skip this slide because we are going to discuss it in the later part of the <laughs> presentation. So basically what we need to uh, understand here is we know the types of the screening tests, the standard age uh, that is set is between 30 and 65 years. So what does our uh, government of India recommendations? The government of India recommendations, according to this, Population-based screening is introduced in 2016 by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. 
So uh, they have recommended VIA once in five years as the screening test from the age of 30 to 65 years. So there, there are a lot of importance given to VIA because it is found to be cheap, easy to do, especially in the communities and other things. But of late, it needs a lot of, it is quite subjective. It needs a lot of quality control. The person has to have enough patience to apply acetic acid, wait for sufficient time, and they should also have a good light. They should, they should be able to identify the estovite lesions and all these things. So I'm not going to discuss about the methodology, but this is the standard recommended test uh, till date by the Ministry of Health in India. <clears throat> Coming to uh, the FOXI recommendation, uh, this is, uh, as I said earlier, even the FOXI also recommends VIA as one of the screening tests, especially in the limited resources places between 30 and 65 years of age, preferably is up to 50 years of age, which we have discussed earlier. So what are you going to do if you do a VIA? If it is negative, you can call them after five years for uh, a repeat screening. If it is positive, what are you going to do? If it is positive, again, you can do a screen and treat approach where the lesion is visible completely and suitable for ablation. You can consider ablation, either cryo or thermal ablation. Or if you think the lesion is suspicious, then definitely you need to refer to a higher center for further management. Or if you don't want to do the screen and treat approach, then definitely, again, you have to refer to a higher center for colposcopy and biopsy. And accordingly, the lady would, the, uh, lady would be triaged. So uh, this is the basic standard recommendation using VIA as a screening test. Even the latest WHO recommendations 2021 also say the same thing. Uh, you do VIA testing if it is negative. Here, only the time interval is three years. Whereas in our recommendation is five years. <clears throat> if it is positive, as I said earlier, the same protocol, see, uh, screen and treat approach. If you are suspecting anything invasion, then you have to refer it. Suppose if it is not suitable for ablation and if it needs an excisional treatment, if the lesion is going into the cervical canal and other things, are these a thick estovite or whatever it is, then it has to be sent to a higher place. So this is, uh, I mean, if it is done in a primary setting, if in your host, whole, I mean, your own hospital, you have the facility to do all these things, you can do it. You need not refer to any higher center. So that is about the VIA testing. Coming to cytology, uh, I mean, many places people are moving from conventional to liquid-based cytology. So whatever cytology procedure you follow, either conventional or liquid-based, <clears throat> the standard is, if it is negative, that means NILM, that means you have not found any uh, intraepithelial lesions, suspicious of uh, uh, low grade or high grade or whatever it is, you will be rescreening them after three years with cytology. But on the other hand, if you see any abnormality in the cytology, you broadly divide them into squamous abnormalities or glandular abnormalities. If they are squamous abnormalities and if they are low grade, that is ASCUS and LCIL, you can again triage them with HPV. And if the HPV is also positive, then you have to do them colposcopy. Suppose if the HPV test is negative and if the report uh, shows only ASCUS, uh, I mean, there is only slight difference between our FOXI GCPR and this guideline. In the FOXI guideline, ASCUS and LCIL can be triaged with HPV. And if both are negative, a repeat test can be done after one year. But in the latest WHO recommendations, only ASCUS triage with HPV. Anything above ASCUS, that means from LCIL onwards, you have to refer them to colposcopy. <clears throat> so if the triage test is negative, then uh, you will call them after three years with cytology. If the triage test is positive, then definitely you need to send them for colposcopy. And based upon the findings, you have to manage. So I have not, uh, uh, there are lots of other guidelines given in the FOXI about uh, cytology, ask us individually, they have given it, but I have not, um, uh, uh, I'm not talking about those because of la uh, lack of time. I'm just going to focus mostly uh, because basically for the cytology, the guideline is very simple in the sense you have to remember low grade abnormalities, triage with HPV. If they are high grade abnormalities, you can uh, straight away consider doing colposcopy. Coming to HPV as a primary screening test, because of late, we are talking a lot about HPV, HPV, HPV. 
So if you are using primary HPV testing, if it is a, a negative, you can call them after five years for <clears throat> screening if it is HPV positive. So if you are doing only a, a, a test where it uh, tells you whether it is negative or positive, like a hybrid capture test, then you have to use a kind of a triage uh, instead of just uh, uh, treating based upon the HPV positive report. So you can't offer treatment just by HPV positive. You have to do a kind of a, uh, a triage to uh, what kind of treatment you want to give, which I'm going to discuss in the subsequent slides. So even in the FOXI recommendations, HPV can be used as a primary screening test. <clears throat> if it is negative, call them after five years. If it is positive, what are you going to do, which is uh, similar both for our FOXI as well as for the WHO recommendations. So there, there used to be a lot of focus on co-testing and of late, I think we are not talking much about co-testing. We are talking more about reflex testing. So earlier we were doing reflex HPV testing. Now people are talking about reflex cytology and other things, but some places maybe still they are doing co-testing. <clears throat> if you are doing co-testing, if both the tests are negative, that means smear and uh, HPV are negative, then you can call them after five years. If HPV is negative and cytology is positive, so the same thing, if it is a low grade because HPV negative and low grade smear, you call them after one year for a repeat test. If it is a high grade, even if it is HPV negative, you call them, you uh, send them for colposcopy. There is a small mistake here. <clears throat> it is HPV positive and cytology negative. So if it is HPV positive and cytology negative, so what you are going to do with the primary HPV testing, similar algorithm you have to follow. You have, you have to do a, a HPV genotyping to see whether the lady has got 16 and 18 HPV. Because 16 and 18 you are considered to be the high risk, more high risk types for uh, cervical cancer. So now with the latest DNA tests, we are uh, trying to do partial genotyping and we are trying to find many other high risk types also which will be shown in the uh, next uh, few slides. <coughs> yeah, excuse me. <clears throat> uh, coming to WHO guidelines, uh, the there is a strong recommendation to move towards HPV DNA testing because of its sensitivity. You can uh, do uh, very few screening tests in the lifetime of a woman. Uh, and it is, it is uh, not a subjective test. So there, uh, there is a strong recommendation to move towards HPV DNA testing as the primary screening test rather than VIA or cytology. But you need to have a quality controlled cytology screening which are approved by WHO or FDA. And then only you should move towards uh, HPV DNA testing. Otherwise, you can uh, continue if you have a good quality of VIA or cytology. So <coughs> this depends upon the facilities at that uh, those are available at our uh, institutes or at our hospitals or even in private sector. So to use HPV DNA testing with our, without a triage, so especially in general population, one can do a screen and treat just like VIA even after HPV DNA testing, um, but it is not so in uh, women who have got uh, HIV. So if you don't want to do screen and treat approach after HPV DNA testing, the same triage of different methods you can use to uh, decide further whether you have want to treat or not. <clears throat> so these are the summary of the recommendations. More or less, it is the same repetition. So start at the age of 30 years and screen every 5 to 10 years. So the advantage of HPV DNA testing, if you have done a a good quality testing, even you can delay up to the age of, uh, the interval can be delayed up to 10 years. So if you are using screen triage and treat also the same recommendation. So you can do screen and treat. This is uh, basically you need to remember this is for general population, not for women with uh, HIV or in a immunocompromised state. So uh, the recommendations, there is a slight difference in the recommendations for women with HIV. Here we start uh, screening at the age of 25 instead of 30. And here we straight away go for a screen triage and uh, treat approach, not the screen and the treat approach. These are the two differences. And the screening interval is three to five years. Instead of five to 10 years, we do every three to five years because they have a higher uh, uh, chance of progression to invasive cancers. And you may see more uh, higher grades of um, CINs in uh, women who have uh, immunocompromised state. 
So uh, coming to other screening recommendations, especially this is applicable to uh, use your resources in the best possible way. So priority should be given to women between 30 and 49 in the general population and 25 and 49 in women with HIV. So you can either do a, a provider collected sample or of late now there is a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, popularity or a lot of talk about the HPV testing by self-testing and which is actually happening in some parts. And I think even in uh, uh, Southern India, especially in Kerala and uh, Tamil Nadu, there are lots of studies happening about this self-collected samples and uh, encouraging women to go towards that. So tie plus tie, twice life testing is also beneficial as we knew that 35 and 45 years. So once you have done a very regular screening after the age of 50, earlier we were talking about 65, but if you uh, have done a good screening and our lady had uh, regular screenings at regular intervals and if the previous two screening tests uh, which are done at five yearly interval are normal, then she can stop screening at the age of 50. So basically this age limit is, uh, are, I don't say it's an age limit, Covering this age group is why it is more important is because this is the time where the chances of precancerous lesions are more. And if you pick up and treat them, the chance of it going into invasive cancer can be reduced. So if you have the facility, if you have the funds, you can screen all women between the age of 30 and 65. So uh, uh, see, as I said earlier, it's not just the screening. We also need to have a kind of a um, follow-up plan. That's very important. So screen and treat, screen, triage and treat. So screen and treat, again, uh, it's very, very familiar to most of us. Most of us are doing community screening. And I know of late with the portable thermal ablators, many are comfortable doing VIA testing, VIA positive lesions. Instead of doing a biopsy, when they are comfortable doing an ablation, they're doing a thermal ablation, which can happen just in one minute time. And there ends the matter. So that is recommended both in our FOXI as well as in uh, uh, the WHO latest recommendation. This is just to uh, minimize the women coming to our clinics again and again, and also doing an approach where definitely it will, even though it's a bit of over treatment, but still it can uh, reduce the incidence of progression to invasive cancer. So on the other hand, if you're using HPV as a uh, primary testing, uh, in general population, you can also do a screen and treat approach. So in this, what you do is you do HPV DNA testing. If it comes positive, you don't know where the lesion is, but you just apply acetic acid. That means it's just like doing a uh, VIA. And if you have seen a lesion and if it is eligible for ablation, the same thing. If it is not eligible, then you have to send for loop excision. But there is one thing. Uh, some people, what they say is, even if you have seen, if you have not seen the lesion, should we ablate the transformation zone or not? So that is one thing. That is uh, probably when you are doing a simple HPV DNA testing without knowing the genotyping, you can't just ablate the entire transformation zone for uh, all women uh, when the test is positive. Probably if you are doing a partial genotyping test, which I'm going to show in the next triage method, there you can think of doing an ablation even if you don't find a lesion. So basically here, if you have done a HPV DNA testing, just like a hybrid capture, which is positive, you have to determine the eligibility for ablative treatment after application of 3 to 5% testic acid with or without magnification. And you follow this algorithm. Suppose uh, you don't want to do this screen and uh, treat approach, you want to triage. So how we were doing a reflex uh, HPV testing in the past, now what people are doing is if HPV test is positive, they are doing a reflex cytology because the same sample can be kept. I mean, if it is in your same, in your own hospital's lab, you can uh, keep it and do a cytology. And if the cytology is negative, so HPV is positive, cytology is negative, you can call them back. And uh, I mean, if it is cytology negative, yeah, and HPV is positive, you rescreen them in three years with cytology. Suppose <clears throat> cytology shows ASCUS. So the lady is already HPV positive and ASCUS. Then you have to uh, do uh, HPV. I mean, yeah, this is basically cytology. Sorry, this is only cytology. And the cytology uh, we have already discussed. So cytology alone, you are using it. If the cytology is negative, rescreen. 
and if it is ascus we have already discussed so cytology ascus triage with hpv and if it is hpv positive colposcopy if hpv negative you rescreen them uh, with 3 years this already we have discussed it's just a repetition so here we are triaging in cytology i just want to emphasize that in cytology we can't straight away do any treatment so if you are following cytology as a screening test the lady has to have a kind of a triage so for the triage if it is a low grade you do with um, hpv if it's a high grade you can do a colposcopy so if you are doing hpv dna testing uh, what happens is if the test comes negative fine if it comes positive then you can do a partial genotyping or you can do a genotyping test you want to know what kind of high risk hpv she is harboring 16 18 or other high risk so if it is 16 and 18 then definitely you have to again consider that she has got a higher chance of going into uh, i mean higher chance the risk is higher i'm not saying that hpv positivity means they have cancer so what we need to be is we need to be more careful to make sure that uh, we are going to do some kind of an active intervention or keeping them under a close follow up so if you have done a hpv testing hpv testing comes positive then do a genotyping if genotyping is positive hpv 16 18 so again you can do a via and uh, as i said earlier you can follow that suppose instead of hpv 16 and 18 uh, other high risk hpv is positive again you want to make sure whether she has a lesion or not if she has a lesion then you can treat it so in these situations 16 and 18 positive some people what they say is are um, if, even if you don't see a lesion because 16 and 18 it can be still a transient phase of infection and if you don't want to leave her because of 16 and 18 maybe you can consider doing a, a ablation of the transformation zone but whereas in other high risk hpv types you need not do a, a ablation when you don't find a lesion you can keep them under follow up so just to make things clear hpv 16 and 18 has got a, a more than 80% of cervical cancers are related to this so we pay a little more attention when you uh, see hpv 16 18 positivity in the partial uh, in the genotyping test i don't call it g partial genotyping test because if you are doing a partial genotyping like cobas or gene expert you already know what kind of uh, hpv she is having 16 18 45 or other high risk then the management algorithm would be here but if you are doing only hpv uh, testing like a hybrid capture then of course if you want to triage you can use uh, this uh, uh, genotyping as one of the triage methods if you uh, other uh, triage is via we have already in, uh, talked a lot about via triage so the same thing here and uh, if you don't want to uh, if you want to do uh, hpv dna testing and either self sampled or collected by clinician and if it is negative same thing if it is positive you can use colposcopy as a triage so you don't want to uh, go for cytology reflex cytology you don't want to do genotyping because it's expensive you can straight away go for colposcopy so uh, you may find a lesion you may not find a lesion if the infection is in the transient phase you may not see any lesion if it already becomes productive and produces cellular changes then only you will see colposcopy findings if you see colposcopy findings then based upon the colposcopy findings biopsy you can decide what you want to do so this is um, uh, yeah i have already covered about the cytology triage in some western countries just to reduce the load over the colposcopy clinics even if they see hpv dna testing if it is positive they do cytology and if the cytology is um, uh, negative they will call them back and do a repeat co testing and if it is um, positive then they will call them for colposcopy so these are all uh, different options of uh, triaging so this is uh, just a summary of the different options what we have discussed so screen and treat visual inspection with acetic acid followed by treatment hpv dna as a primary screening test followed by treatment uh, in these are all in general population then if it is a screen triage treat if you are doing cytology as the primary primary screening test definitely it has to be triaged with colposcopy or in a low grade abnormalities with um, hpv testing 
If you are using HPV as a primary screening test, then you have to do a, a genotyping. And then uh, uh, if the genotyping shows high risk, then you can triage. If it is a, a primary, instead of doing a genotyping straight away, you can do VIA triage. Or if you have a high risk HPV DNA as a screening test, if you don't want to do any kind of these triages, you can go colposcopy as a triage. And or the other way of triage is cytology. And uh, that means you are using the available screening tests to the best possible way and want to decide what would be the best way of uh, triaging and best way of managing that particular woman. That is what we have to understand. Well, instead of rushing uh, every woman to a colposcopy clinic, you can triage and uh, send them for further evaluation. So I, I'll miss this. I mean, I'll just skip this treatment recommendations because it is not part of my talk. If you have done a treatment, definitely the lady has to be followed up after uh, 12 months, uh, be it is general population, be it uh, HIV positive women. So follow up is very important just to make sure that the lesion has a cleared. It's not just one uh, ma month year, you have to follow them for the next 20 years. So my take home message is the last slide. <clears throat> you have to plan strategies to change to HPV screening wherever possible, to aim for screen and treat strategy wherever feasible. We have to improve the coverage and outcome of cervical cancer uh, screening to reach the WHO global targets for cervical cancer elimination. It is the percentage of women who are covered by screening is more important than doing the screening for the same population again and again. So you have to cover a wider area of population to look for cervical cancer elimination. Thank you very much for uh, listening to my talk patiently. And if you have any queries, uh, please, uh, I'm uh, ready to answer. I hope I have conveyed some useful message uh, to the audience today. Thank you very much. I am Dr. Gina Babiraj. First of all, I must thank the Public Awareness Committee for COXI for giving me this opportunity. And it is my honor to chair the session of Leela Digamati, Madam, ICCP President, and also along with Damini Devi, Madam, to Star Wars. And Damini, uh, Leela, Madam, it's come very well explained the guidelines, FOXI guidelines, Government of India guidelines, and WHO guidelines. And all these guidelines say okay, we have to do the, if we are doing pap smear screening or cytology screening, it has to be every three years, starting from 25 years to 65 years. And if you are planning to do VAA screening, that is from 30 years to 65 years, every five years, according to Indian screening, Indian guidelines. And the recent WHO guidelines, it is every three years. If you are doing this HPV testing, it is every, the, we can repeat the test after five to 10 years. So the sensitivity of HPV testing is very, very high. But coming to the pap smear test, the cytology, the sensitivity is only around 50 percentage. That is why it has to be repeated every three years. And VAA test, the, it is always subjective. So the, that depends on the, the result depends on the experience of the person who is doing the test. So as of now, there is no organized screening program in India. What we are doing is the opportunistic screening. So we are asked the government is not coming up with the organized screening program. So this, without this, uh, with this opportunistic screening, we are missing a lot of cases. So if you are doing this opportunity screening, it is better to shift to HPV DNA testing because the sensitivity is very high and the missing of case is very low. And we have to repeat only after 10 years, five to 10 years, 10 years, we, have get, we will get 10 years. And if the lady is coming after 50 years, just do a one HPV testing. If it is negative, getting further HPV infection and precancerous conditions, CIN and CSRV is very, very low. So it is high time that we have to shift to HPV DNA testing. And in Kerala, we are done this HPV DNA testing in our gynecologist, KFOG members, which is partially funded by the KFOG. And uh, we have done the COBAS HPV testing. And uh, around 
60 percentage of the kind of eligible persons are uh, done this test. But in our population also, the SPV test is positive for the SPV positive rate is two percentage. So it is there in the low risk, very low risk population of gynecologists. But in the same time, in Kerala, we have done uh, pap smear, the cytology pap smear screening of one village. Last year, we have completed one village. All the eligible population are screened, the pap smear screening. That uh, comes around 1,500 cases, 500 ladies are screened, but there is no single screen positive with the cytology. So that, that, that shows that the sensitivity of the cytologies. So it is high time we have to shift from the cytology and the VI test to the SPV DNA testing. And the other things, Madam has explained how we follow up all those cases. And uh, only the testing is not much helpful. If there is positive cases, we have to treat them. Then only we will get the results. That's it. We can eliminate the conditions. So <laughs> Madam has explained everything. This is what I want to say. Just this. <laughs> Thank you. I think Dr. Dr. Leela, it was an excellent presentation. And Dr. Gina has very clearly summarized whatever Dr. Leela has said. So I think basically the screening should be, ideally it should be HPV based, but it depends upon the resources that is available. So it is better to have at least a via willy followed by a cytology rather than not screening the patient. So only thing is, as a part of the, uh, as gynecologist, we must not prevent any lady who is stepping into our OPD without us examination of the breast and the cervix because these two are the cancers which can be very easily picked up or just a simple screening by using a speculum examination we can further advise the patient that you need to have a cytology or you need to have a, a hpv testing so that is the way creating awareness and then proper screening based upon the economy that is the main thing to reduce uh, uh, cancer of the cervix and i think by 2030 we will be able to achieve this if all the gynecologists put our hands together. And I thank the PAC uh, um, so committee for giving me this excellent opportunity of sharing Dr. Leela, uh, I mean, sharing Dr. Leela's uh, talk. And I think I too have learned a lot. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, madam. Thank you. Madam, one word about the cost factor, madam. If you are hmm. in a private setup, not in the government setup, if you are doing the pap smear screening, it, uh, you have to do it. I, for a period of 10 years, minimum three screening is done. Screening is needed. So around the cost, patient has to come repeatedly and all those things. That cost around the, for each screening, around 1,000 rupees they will, the minimum 1,000 rupees they have. So three screening in 10, uh, 10 years, 3,000 rupees. Screening for a them. single test, SPV test, it's only, it's around 3,000 something. Yeah. So why, why if we, uh, calculate the cost then also this HPV testing is better I think I think people are now aware about the health uh, aspect there and they won't hesitate to get this test done yeah thank you for giving me this opportunity thank you thank you yeah thank you I think so there is one question uh, somebody wanted to know uh, this one why cryo why thermal ablation in place of cryo I mean, both dermal ablation and cryo are uh, can be used as an ablative treatment, but it is uh, easier to do thermal ablation compared to cryo because for cryo, you need to carry that uh, uh, nitrous oxide cylinder, the probes, and actually the cryo gun sometimes leak and everything. And the procedure also, the freeze the freeze technique takes about yeah. three, five, three. Time also. Yeah, whereas with the thermal ablation, and we have a portable liger thermal ablator, then VSAP thermal ablator, all these things. The time uh, duration is only uh, less than a minute. And the another advantage of ablation, thermal ablation is you can do a multiple uh, applications over the, if you, somebody has got a large transformation zone, you can actually use different kinds of, there are different sizes of probes also, flat probes and everything. So you can uh, cover the entire transformation zone. When you are using a cryo, you, you have only um, a single, I mean, limited size probes and you can't do multiple applications. Sometimes the edges may not be covered when you are using uh, this cryo. Whereas with the thermal ablation, the um, coverage of uh, destruction of the transformation zone is uh, more. 
you can do complete uh, treatment. So that's where people are preferring. And even if you want to take for camp setting, it's all battery charged. You don't need power or anything. So that's why we are moving towards uh, thermal ablation. Even CIN2, uh, where uh, the IHC is negative, that means a lower grade of CIN2, you can still go ahead and do thermal ablation. So the only thing is uh, the similar criteria. The entire lesion should be visible. The lesion should be less than 75%. Uh, and especially for a TA, even if it is a little more than 70%, 5% also, you can destroy it. So that's why that is the advantage because there's a question in the chat box. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, madam. That was thank me, Dr. Bharti. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, Ramni, ma'am. And thank you, Jaina, ma'am, for sharing the session. Leela, ma'am, thank you so much for an elaborate talk. Uh, you have made the job of our panelists for the next panel very, very simple. Let's uh, move on. Uh, let's move on to the, the next academic um, session of this webinar. That is the panel discussion on cervical screening methods and vaccination. Our moderators for today are Dr. Bharti Rajshrekar, ma'am, and Dr. B. Aruna Suman, ma'am. Our expert panelist is Serena Galvas, ma'am. Uh, can we have the slides, please? Uh, the moderator, uh, Dr. Bharti Rajshrekar, ma'am, is the coordinator of no. the South Zone. I just shorted all the introductions, so we yes, save time. <laughs> uh, she is the South Zone coordinator for the Public Awareness Committee, and she is a medical director uh, and consultant at Watsa Olya Hospital, Hassan. Yeah. She has also been the honorary secretary at Kasoga. We welcome you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I welcome our next moderator, Dr. Aruna Suman, ma'am. She is the uh, professor, HOD, and vice principal at Government Medical College of the Jagityal Telangana. She has Thank you, Dr. Monica. Yes, yeah, let's continue with the program. And she is the South Zone coordinator for Foxy 22 to 23. We welcome both of you to continue the more panel discussion. I would like to introduce Serena, ma'am, as the expert panelist. She is a professor in HOD of the uh, Obstetrics and Gynecology Department of the Jubilee Mission Medical College Hospital. She has uh, been in the postgraduate teaching till the year 1994. She's an excellent academician. Ma'am has also been a faculty at various conferences. She's uh, been the president of Risu Robijiva Society in 2003 and 2004. We welcome you, ma'am. Thank you. And we have the panelists today. Uh, uh, we have a panel of eight galaxy, uh, stars of the galaxy, who will be highlighting the aspects of cervical screening. Our first panelist, Dr. Geeta, ma'am. She's a senior consultant uh, at Mother Hospital, Prisur, Kerala. She has been a, from a, a former professor, uh, professor and unit chief at Amala Institute of Medical Sciences, Prisur. She has been the president of the Prisur Obijuwai Society uh, currently, and she's the editor of POGS Monthly Bulletin from the year 2017 to 2020. <laughs> We welcome you, ma'am. Thank you. Our next panelist is Dr. Prabha, ma'am. She uh, is from Gadak, Karnataka. Her affiliation includes Hirsch Multispeciality Hospital, Gadak, which is an ADBH accredited hospital. She has been conducting IG training courses in gynec endoscopy, and she has been elected uh, the president of the Gadak OBGY Society. We welcome you, ma'am. Our next panelist today is Dr. Lata Chaturvil, ma'am. She is a professor of OBGYN and faculty of medical education, Jipmar Pondicherry. She is currently the president of OBGYN Society of Pondicherry, and she is, has an uh, holds an executive MBA in hospital administration. She has also done a fellowship in gynec oncology and infertility. We welcome you, ma'am. Our next panelist is Dr. Chandra Poluswamy, ma'am. She is an obstetrician, gynecologist, and an IVF consultant from Namakkal. Thank you. Well, we welcome you, ma'am. Our next panelist is Professor Arjuna Singh, ma'am. She is an FICOG degree and fellowship in Baker Endoscopy. She is a pro uh, consultant at Yashoda Hospital, Hyderabad, and Basan Sani Hospital, Hyderabad. She has been the secretary of uh, Hyderabad Society in the year 2021. She has been a brilliant, uh, had a brilliant academic career with a gold medal in MBBS and has received many accolades. We welcome you, ma'am. Our next panelist is Padmaja, ma'am. Uh, she <coughs> has her high fields of interest, including high-risk pregnancy, gynec endoscopy, and preventive health care of women. She's a senior consultant gynecologist at Adarsh Hospital, Raja Mudri, and currently she's the president of the Raja Mudri Obstetrics and Gynecological Society. 
we welcome you ma'am our next panelist is dr amruta ramachandran she is the additional professor of obstetrics and gynecology at government medical college kozhi pude it is our final panelist is dr rupa prakash madam she is a former professor, uh, professor and unit head of the jss medical college mysore she is also a senior consultant uh, at apollo bgs hospital and kamakshi hospital mysore she has been the former secretary of mysore obgy society and currently she is the president of the same society she has a teaching experience of almost 20 years i am sure with these faculties we will be enlightening uh, all the delegates to a very very smooth process of cervical screening we welcome our moderators to carry forward the session thank you uh, dr monica for this uh, introduction and i at the outset would like to thank foxy president dr rishikesh pai and the public awareness ah, committee chair dr priya dr priyanku rao for giving us this opportunity and i would say that i am indeed ah, privileged to have the doyens like dr ramani devi dr anjalakshi dr jina over here and uh, dr jin uh, dr uh, leela has made our job very easy and most of the answers are out for the panelists so without wasting much time i would like to share my screen and we will go to the panel can i share my screen now yes ma'am you can yeah. please yeah. is it visible yes, yes. ma'am it is visible yeah. just I make it full make screen slide show yeah just a minute just just uh, just give me a minute Yes, ma'am. Screens are visible. Right. I know. I just let me make it slideshow. Yes. Right. Yes. Fine. Sorry for the technical glitch. Uh, well, uh, we have been talking about uh, the cancer cervix mukta bharat and. Madam, it has not become a slideshow yet. Not yet. It's there on my screen yeah. as slideshow. Yeah, but not in us in the common display. Okay. Do I do I need to stop it and go back again? Ma'am, yeah. ma'am. Actually, your uh, this Microsoft PowerPoint version is low. Uh -huh. uh, this is a technical problem. So do do? you can uh, uh, share the screen without uh, making it slideshow, ma'am. Okay, fine, fine. This is the technical problem from Microsoft end. Okay, sorry, sorry. So let me share it again, right? Just I'll share, share the screen. Don't make it slideshow, ma'am. Okay, fine, fine. Is it now? Is it same? Is it okay? Yes, yes ma'am. Fine. Fine. Okay. fine. So yeah. can I go ahead? Can I go ahead? Yes, yes ma'am. Ma yeah. So, well, we have a luminary of panelists with us over here. And I thank uh, Dr. Aruna Suman to be my co-moderator and uh, Dr. Sarina, who will be the expert here to take us through this very informative and very useful uh, panel. I'm not able, my slides are not moving. Just click on the in-between them one time and now try to move the screen. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, well, the burden of cervical cancer, all of us are familiar with, and for paucity of time, I will be skipping. We know that in India, almost one uh, one woman in eight minutes is tested positive, and we contribute to almost 23% of the cancer cervix deaths. But do we have hope for these women? Let us see what our panelists have to say. So, Dr. Archana, how could we reduce the burden of cancer cervix in India? <clears throat> It, uh, we know. Good, uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, uh, Public Awareness Committee, for giving me this opportunity. And thank you, Foxy, for being giving us uh, so much of opportunity and for learning and discussing. The question is: the cervical cancer can it be the load can be prevented? Yes, the load can be prevented not only by screening but by vaccination also. We know that prevention is the best cure. But when it comes to cancer cervix, most of the time, unfortunately, we diagnose when the time is too late to 
prevent it. So why not start early and start vaccination? The lifestyle modification as such, the government and the FOXI has done very good step towards the encouragement for increasing the age of marriage uh, for 21 years or so. But still, even uh, JSK scream and all, the marriage age and early pregnancy has reduced. So overall, we are on the right track. And vaccination, if it is given on school basis also, pro probably will be reducing the cancer cervix burden. The aim is 90, 70, and 90. 90% of the patient, uh, girls should be vaccinated. 70% should be screened. And 90% cancer should be treated. We can do it only if we do all the three steps. And one prevention is better than 10 corrective measures. And 10 corrective measures are better than, and they cannot compare with one life saved. So we have to work hard and we have to work fast. Thank you, Dr. Archana. I now request uh, Dr. Aruna Suman, my co-moderator, to take over. Dr. Aruna, please. And Thank you, Bharati ma'am, for this opportunity. I feel very happy to be your co-moderator. Thank you, Hrishikesh Pai, sir, yes. Alka Pandey, madam, and uh, Priyankur Roy for this opportunity. Continue to continue with the panel. What is the most common cause of ca cervical cancer? Dr. Chandra Ponuswami, can you please answer? Yeah, at the outset, it's my privilege to thank uh, Public Awareness Committee, Dr. Priyankur Roy, Dr. Monika, Dr. Sadapti, and Chairpersons, Dr. Bharti, Dr. Sumana, uh, Anna, and uh, Dr. Gilwas. Then, uh, as we all, after the speech, and uh, we know that HPV is the most common cause, which produces almost 100% is the cause for the uh, cancer survey. I mean, though there are more than 100 types of HPV are available, few types are more oncogenic. Uh, HPV 16 and 18. It produces 75% of cervical cancer and more than 50% 50, 50 of vaginal and ulvar cancer. But the non-cancer producing uh, types, HPV 6 and 11, they are the cause for anogenital warts, 90% of anogenital warts. So the culprit is HPV. We have to uh, mean treat HPV then there are various types of uh, papilloma virus. Certain types affect the skin between its uh, aspect and certain types affect the mucosal type, which the uh, uh, virus which affects the uh, mucosa, even that 16 and uh, 18 are the most oncogenic property. And how these HPV virus, once they enter the epithelial tissue, they get uh, replicated. They enter into the epithelial cells, they get repl replicated, then they stay there for quite some time. As Dr. Leela said, it gets uh, spontaneously gets healed, but in course of time, another 10 to 13, 30 years, in uh, less, I mean, if they get more and more uh, repeated infection or in immunocompromised persons, it uh, takes into form of precancerous and cancerous lesion. Thank you, madam. Uh, now, Dr. Geeta, is it possible to get ourselves protected from cervical cancer? Um, uh, good evening, everyone. At the outset, let me thank uh, the Public Awareness Committee. Uh, it's my privilege to be part of this session. Yeah, and uh, to answer your question, ma'am, yes, to a very large extent, it is possible to protect uh, our population against uh, uh, human papilloma virus infections and uh, CSRVX, ultimately CSRVX. So as uh, Madam said, uh, it is caused by HPV infect, uh, virus. And uh, if we see the uh, cycle, most of it gets uh, uh, eliminated within one or two years, but the ones which remain are going to cause the uh, 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 progress to CSRVX. So if we can catch at the point before the HPV infection becomes rampant or at the time when it is causing low-grade lesions or changes in the cell uh, cells, then that, that way we can probably uh, prevent it progressing into CSRVX. So vaccine prevention is probably the best one, but uh, if not possible, then probably screening would be 
the next step that we can. So primary as well as I think primordial prevention already Dr. Uh, uh, previously uh, told. So my this thing will be vaccine as well as uh, the secondary prevention by screen. Dr. So Ahmed, what, uh, we have a lot of time. Uh, actually, the, we have a lot of time in between where we can catch before it develops into CSR. Yeah. So what are the types of uh, HPV vaccines? Dr. Aruna Suman, you can take it forward. Dr. Amruta. Yes. How do HPV vaccine prevent cancer cervix? Dr. Amruta, can you elaborate on this, please? Uh, at the outset, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, HPV vaccine uh, prevents CA cervix by active immunization. So virus-like particles are uh, released into the system, which uh, stimulates the active immunization, antigen-antibody reaction occurs, and uh, antibodies are produced, uh, which uh, once it starts circulating in the system, will be able to neutralize uh, whenever the virus enters the body. So that uh, happens to be the mode of action of HPV vaccine. Dr. Aruna, you can take the next question. Okay. Dr. Lata Chaturvedula, yeah. how many types of vaccines are <coughs> available now? Yeah, it was three now. Thankfully, India has produced one more. So, <laughs> so we have a Cervarix vaccine, which has uh, mainly 16 and 18 against the oncogenic uh, HPV. Then we have uh, Gardasil 4, quadrivalent, which also is against uh, warts. Now, the question is why warts have to be treated. It may not produce cancers, but again, yeah, it may uh, interfere with the sexual activity. So that is also very important to treat the warts. Then now we have Gardasil 9, which has not just 16, 11, 16, and 18, and other oncogenic numbers like 31, 32, 45, 52, and 58. What India has brought out, Sarvavac, which is already available in certain metros, but with a cost of 2,000 rupees. Uh, that has, that's again a quadrivalent vaccine, which has all four, six, 11, 16, and 18. So which uh, one do you prefer? <laughs> whichever can, government can give me free of cost, at least the quadrivalent vaccine, which is cheaper. I mean, which is cheaper among whatever is available, but definitely is quadrivalent. If not, at least something to prevent the oncogenic viruses that is 16 and 18. Preference for me, being in a government setup, it's always whichever is the, most cost-effective one. Yeah, I and think government that, is okay. making one vaccine which is available for two hundred to four hundred. Yeah, that no, is no, single not. dose vaccine. It's going to come up in future. Yeah, no, yeah, I know. Is, that's what. But right think, now, what is available is two thousand. No, I think right now, Cerverix is off yes. the market. Could yeah. yeah. I interrupt? Uh, Cerverix yeah. is off the market, market now. Yes. We only have yes. Gardasil four and Gardasil. Gardasil. Nine, but yeah. uh, hope for the uh, indigenous vaccine is it is going to be 2000 a while which contains two doses so yeah. it's going to be around 1000 rupees oh, that is what the latest news yeah that is if people, two people can share it yeah. and be probably a by april i think i uh, may sorry by june uh, we hope that it will be introduced in the national immunization protocol so dr yes. lata i am sure it will be available free of cost sure, sure. for all our <laughs> girls yes <laughs> thank you yeah. Yeah. so now Dr. Padmaja, how are the doses scheduled? Uh, uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Fortri and the Public Awareness Committee. I feel extremely privileged to be part of this wonderful program, madam. And coming to the dosage schedule, um, uh, it's wonderful to have a vaccine. And in fact, the uh, cancer which vaccine is the only vaccine against the cancer uh, of all the malignancies. And dosage schedule below 14 14 and below, the uh, girl or uh, the child needs only two doses given at zero and six months. If she is After less than 14 15 years. years. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Less than 15 years, zero and six months. Above 15 years, uh, we have to give three doses at the schedule of zero, two and six. Uh, uh, this is the standard dosage schedule what we follow. If they have missed some time, suppose if they have not taken the second schedule by uh, the uh, end of two months, uh, we have to see that the three schedules are uh, three doses are finished within a year. The immunogenicity and antibody uh, the level of antibodies evoked are almost in par with the standard schedule. And uh, 
the age group which have to be vaccinated the best age to target is the age 11 to 12 years this is the best age and the reason and the maximum course, coverage can speaking, be up to uh actually according to the indian fda guidelines up to 45 uh 45 um, and of course internationally they're recommending up to 26 years okay i think aruna that's coming later i think <laughs> okay okay sorry <laughs> no, it's okay it's okay yeah next what is it essential to start the schedule at why is it essential to start the schedule at 9 to 10 years what is the advantage dr prabha desai Prabha, are you there? Are you listening? Hello. Yes, Prabha. She's there. Yes. Are you listening to me? Hello. Am I? Yes, Prabha, please go on. Yes, Dr. Prabha, continue. Go on. You are not audible, Dr. Prabha. Now? Yeah, now you are. Now? Yes, yes. Now, please go ahead. See, the age of uh, starting this uh, at early age, the advantages are very uh, good because of the young age and the adolescent, their auto um, um, antibody formations are of very good quality and they are very high levels of antibodies which they reach at the young adolescent's age. And second thing is, as they are not at exposed to the HPV vaccines, uh, yes. Uh, in the form of sexual contact and all, the efficacy is more at this age and also uh, cost of the immunization is less in the most of the adolescents who just needs two doses at below 14 age and above that we have to give a three doses. So considering these all four uh, important uh, advantages of giving the adolescents at 9 to 10 age, I uh, Actually, not only gynecologists, I think all the yeah. pediatricians have also started in their uh, in, uh, vaccination schedule and giving the options to the mothers. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Prabha. So we need to start early because only two doses, we save money. And they're more receptive in adolescent when the pediatrician tells them to take a vaccine yeah. Yeah. rather than the gynecologist telling them. <laughs> So, Dr. Rupa, what are the protocols in special situations like pregnancy, lactation, immunocompromised, etc.? Thank you very much for including me in this panel, uh, Bharti, and uh, thanks for the opportunity, Monica. There are several situations uh, where uh, you may have to defer, but most often, uh, especially in uh, women with uh, HIV positive, uh, it, is, it remains the same. And then supposing they miss a dose, uh, so wherever there is interruption, you continue with the rest of the dose and uh, complete it within a year. In pregnancy and lactation, it is not recommended. But nowadays, they say in lactation, you can go ahead with the yes. vaccination schedule. Bottom period. Yes. Yeah. And uh, victims of sexual abuse, of course, three doses, initiate preferably at the time of examination at healthcare facility. Women with history of abnormal screening report. You have done a screening test, they're positive, but go ahead with uh, vaccination because uh, uh, it offers you protection, same age oh. recommendation. And in India, still male no uh, has not been licensed. So it's only for the female, though they are the also the carriers and they also pass on the uh, virus to the female. It's not yet. So lactation, they can. But in pregnancy, it's not recommended. Yeah. Well, Dr. Arjuna, now coming to boys, do they need to be vaccinated? Yes, of course. Uh, okay. It is needed not only because it prevents uh, cervical cancer, it also no, prevents so vulval uh, cancer 70% and 75% of vaginal cancer. Yeah. But for boys, 90% of uh, anal cancer and 75% of penile cancer can be prevented. Yes. So it is high time that we realize that 60 to 70% of uh, penile cancer and 90% of anal cancer can be prevented by uh, giving this simple vaccination, which is same that uh, below 15 years, three doses we can give, 15 to 21 years we have to give uh, two do uh, the three doses and then 75, uh, and then uh, we have to offer them 
not a compulsion, but 21 to 26, we have to offer. And 26 to 45, they can, although it is not recommended, but it is better to take, particularly in our setup where the screening and <coughs> prevention uh, can bring forth the reduction in penile cancer and anal cancer also. Yeah. Uh, Madam, uh, Dr. Sarina, the ex our expert, I have a question. Uh, because it is not yet approved in India, if they some parent comes and asks them asks us to give the vaccine to the boys, uh, can we do that? I Dr. think um, uh, to answer your question, uh, Dr. Bharati, I feel yes. that we should, you said some time back, isn't it, that by April, you're going to get the government of India yes, to Madam. include it in the vaccination protocol. Probably yes. we should wait, wait for that landmark before we promote it to the boys. Yes, because so that, right now, yeah, girls yeah, are a right priority. Now we don't, yeah, exactly, exactly. In our setup. Thank you, Madam. So now, well, uh, this question is to Dr. Chandra. Chandra. Yeah, someone has received... Uh, at the age of 9 to 14 years, they received two doses of HPV vaccine less than five, five months apart. And uh, should you give them the third dose? Definitely, because the interval should be at least six months. So yes. if they've given before five months, maybe the second dose would not have acted. So we have to give the third dose. Yes. yes. And even if the second dose is given earlier than five months, four months, three months like that also, then... We have to repeat the third dose. Yeah, this we are going to skip because Dr. Rupa has already answered this question. Yes. So now, uh, Dr. Geeta, there is Mrs. Uh, Miss B, 19 years. She's taken two injections of cervix. And then now she is coming for her third dose. But however, cervix is off the market now. So what are her options? Yeah, any vaccine which is uh, available can be used. And the same schedule should be continued. That's all that is important. So yeah, she can complete is, the schedule using uh, whatever vaccine is available in the market. Yeah, that is the yes, message I think uh, yeah. we wanted to go through. Well, yeah. Dr. Hema, uh, Dr. Hema has been replaced by Dr. Amruta. So there is Mrs. S, yes, 30 years, 38 years. She has, has HPV screening done. It's negative. She does have a family history of cancer cervix. She wants to get vaccinated. Guidelines say that uh, the international guidelines, not the FOXI guidelines. So what precautions will you take before you counsel her for the vaccine? What would you tell her? And the problem here is um, she is uh, 38 years. So the ideal age would have been between 9 and 14. So she has completed that age group. And um, uh, the efficacy of the vaccine between this, uh, in this particular age is not as high as in the uh, pubertal age group because the woman may already have been exposed to an HPV infection. And uh, besides that, uh, I think uh, preference at this age group should have been to screening rather than vaccination and uh, she will require three doses so yeah, she has been screened but then she says i would like take the vaccine too yeah of course yeah of course. so then you have to give it to her but before that you have to counsel her and tell them that it is not going to be 99 percent the protection and she should tell them that the efficacy may be less and she has to continue with the screening procedures as per the schedules of her of the national guidelines thank you dr aruna you can to continue, continue with that, how to counsel for vaccination, Dr. Lata? Uh, how do you uh, yeah. counsel? Yes, uh, this is a bit uh, difficult, especially when it, it comes to HPV, because when we say HPV, cervical cancer, and all people will get alarmed. So better not to tell them that, you know, give too much of uh, information, scientific information, and say this is because of sexual activity and, you know, multiple sexual partners and all those things. We, I would like to relate it with the vaccines which prevent diseases, which already children would have got earlier. Maybe that will be more receptive for them to take it. And as someone has already told, include it in the universal immunization program. So they take it, okay, this is natural for everyone to take and it will be better. I feel that way it will be better rather than giving them too much of scientific knowledge. And try to uh, keep the daughter also with them and make them understand, at least tell them that there is a malignancy which is being affected, uh, which is because of this particular thing, which this vaccine will definitely sort of bring down the incidence of cervical cancer, which is very common. That's how I would like to counsel the patient. So this is a good slide showing the, yeah. how, to, how exactly to counsel, ensure yeah. right choice of words, like today, prevent cancer, keep healthy, protect, we, I, our, together, benefit, love. And words and phrases to avoid 
percentage immunity sexually transmitted and promiscuous this is a very good slide that madam has made very thank nice you so thank you aruna yeah so yes, let can i just on. add one point yes please yes please yeah nowadays with uh, this corona and the corona vaccination it has become very easy to counsel women about uh, i mean mm -hmm. the families to take uh, this hpv yeah. vaccination yeah. because like uh, the government has really done a good job of vaccinating uh, crores of uh, people against corona yes, so yeah. now the counseling has become a little easier of course we never say that it is a cancer vaccine and uh, like how uh, covid uh, corona virus causing covid we say this hpv virus causes many cancers and like how you have taken vaccine to protect you against covid this is a vaccine to protect you against hpv infection and other things and i think i don't find that difficulty to counsel um, people against uh, uh, hpv vaccination and other things uh, so yeah and this has made our job very easy nowadays and people are really understanding it true madam and, and true one madam. more thing Thank we you. can always tell is now government of india is sort of promoting and it is going to give us at a low cost i would say it may not be free or free of cost yeah, yeah. or free, whichever yeah, one more thing <laughs> one more thing i want to add because uh, it not so takes when we are like family that we are treating their family no so from childhood itself we will be seeing the girls so they mother uh, easily they I uh, mean, get confidence in us, and they take the injections easily. They yes, don't sir. deny. Very true. Very true. Uh, yeah, Dr. Yes. Barthi, if I may add one thing. Yes, madam. I think please. The best Dr. way Selena. to counsel them would be just tell them this one thing: that this is a very common cancer in India. It is the commonest genital cancer, and it is totally preventable by the vaccination. Just that. I think with that yes. they will take it. We don't have to tell them how is the mode of transmission. She can also get it from her husband, right? Exactly. So, that we don't have. <laughs> but we, we have. have a, I in my hospital have a very small flyer in the regular in the local language, which I give it to everybody who walks inside, and that I will display at the end of my presentation. Okay, so that fine. makes them understand, and they come back and ask us for the vaccine. Give it to the mother; she comes back with the daughter. <laughs> so let's move ahead. Uh, Dr. Padmaja, there was a lot of talk about uh, when uh, the safety of the vaccine and a few years back, there were a lot of rumors in the newspapers. Yeah. What about the safety protocols? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, in fact, a very uh, eye-opening. Um, uh, initially, when the Gardasil was uh, introduced and when clinical trials were happening, there was a lot of hue and cry that uh, some tribal girls, they had experimented on some tribal girls and there, there was the cause of death of some girls. Uh, Especially at your place. The studies went on. Yeah. Dr. Parmaja, yes. this yes. happened at your yes. place. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, 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 madam. Yes. Uh, so finally, uh, the clinical trials were on, and it came to the awareness. It created awareness, lot of public awareness, and the uh, there are enough studies today to tell that there are the safety profile of the vaccine is very, very favorable and very acceptable safety profile. Most of the reactions are very minimal. And just they include the mild uh, local reactions like uh, redness, uh, some pain and some swelling, like any other injection. Very few uh, uh, people who have uh, the fear of injection or something like that, uh, who have that injection phobia, they mm -hmm. might have things like uh, uh, some reeling sensation or uh, syncopal attacks. For them to avoid that, it is better to uh, ask them to lie down and give the injection. Uh, and uh, just observe them for uh, half an hour and send them after half an hour. That's all. Another thing very safe yeah. to use it. Another thing, Dr. Aruna yes. and Pudmaja, what I do is I personally give the vaccination to these girls. They're very confident. I don't make yes, my nurse yes. give the vaccine. Yes. So they're very Same happy. here, madam. Yes. Same here. Even I do, that makes this, a I difference. do that. That yes, makes no. a difference. Yes. You just talk to them and give it to them. Yes. It's fine. Yes. And because it's expensive, they are very happy that the gynecologist has given it to them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So now I would uh, keep this question to all the panelists. What can we do to get this 90% target in India? We can add on and then we'll move to the next part of our panel for and make, uh, move it along faster. We need a lot of awareness programs. Yes. Basically, a yes. lot of awareness programs. That is most important. Uh, and from the level of schools, the parents have to be uh, uh, created awareness. The school children have to be created awareness. And there should be awareness programs in uh, all uh, private schools as well as the government schools. The teachers have to be aware to convey the message to the kids. 
Mm. Uh, Sarina and Dr. Uh, Leela, madam, can you add to this as experts? What is it that you wanted? How do we achieve this 90% target of vaccination in our country? Yeah, exactly what you said, Dr. Bharati. That is exactly. the most important thing. And it is so achievable because if you make it a vaccination protocol in the national vaccination protocol, it will just glide along. Before they leave school, everyone, boy and girl, should be getting this vaccination. Yeah. I think we'll achieve more than 90%. Yes. Teachers and that time it will be affordable also, I think. Yeah. Teachers and parents need to be educated more than the children because they I have need, to motivate them. I want to add here, Dr. Rupa, I think initially, I mean, many gynecologists, sorry to say, still do not talk about the vaccination. Yes. You have to catch on every oh. opportunity yeah. and to the general practitioners, to the IMA doctors, to the pediatricians, yes. talk, even, talk, talk about HPV vaccination and screening. Yeah. Yeah. Even the staff in our departments also and the wards, yeah. They, uh, the doctors, staff, everybody, if they are counseled, then that forms a big group. Yes, madam. So, see, there are these states of Punjab and Sikkim, in spite of it being a paid vaccine, have given it, have ensured that it is there. And so, if we have a will, there is always a way, even if it is difficult. We just have That's to find true. a pathway for that. So, now we move on. Dr. Easy. Aruna, please take over. Yeah. Okay, let us come to screening part of this. What is screening? What are the criteria Hello. of ideal screening methods? I think Dr. Prabha. Can someone take over? Please let Dr. us be Prabha. quick. Yeah, be quick. Dr. Dr. Prabha, please. Screening, ideal. Please You're not come, to your, come closer to your mic and speak. Remove Dr. your ear, earphones. Remove your earphones. I think she's using headphones. Okay. No, she's not audible. Somebody else can take the question. Yeah, an ideal screening method should be very simple. No. Yes. High sensitivity, high specificity, cheap, easily available and accurate. And depending on that, we should be able to give a solution to the patient, whether she needs further treatment or does not need anything, just a follow-up. Yeah. Thank you, Rupa. Dr. Prabha, you can take this question. Yeah, one minute. Uh, am I audible now? Yeah, now you are, please. Okay. See, uh, what, what are the different the, methods? What are the different yeah, yeah. methods of cervical cancer screening? The first, first foremost is very old, old standard is a tax screening, followed by nowadays most recommended is HPV screening, and along with the pap smear screening, that is a cytology, either liquid based cytology or uh, even regular pap smear is also. Oh, she's still not audible. Not audible. So not now, audible I mean, can I? Shall I? Yeah, just somebody else. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Somebody else yeah. Can go ahead. It's conventional cytology, molecular study, HPV, then visual inspection. So all these three methods we can do. So cytology, as Dr. Leela elaborately told, cytology was the conventional pap smear. Then if they are affordable, we can go in for HPV DNA testing. Or sometimes instead of cytology, they go for lipid-based cytology also, HPV. Then in low settings, we can do VAA yeah, or VILI yeah. inspection. Which are the methods that are followed widely now? What are Pap using? smear. In Pap smear, smear is widely yeah. followed still. Yeah. In some of the primary health centers still in Arcturus in Tamil Nadu, we get a lot of patients who get a VIA yeah. done and they are referred. So yeah. it is actually working quite well for us. So at least we can directly do a colposcopy or cytology depending on what it is. Of course, in institutes, I think most of us follow pap smear, okay. conventional pap smear, and now we have all moved on to, most of okay. us have moved on to liquid-based cytology. What about the panelists in the private sector? Can they tell me what they follow? Pap smear. It is liquid-based cytology and if affordable, HPV testing. <coughs> I, am, I am able to do my HPV with hybrid, yeah. uh, with the high-risk groups with a very concessional rate. I already put it in the chat box. Uh, somebody said it's 3,000. I do it. I have been working with the companies and I have got it for 1,000 rupees. And I've been doing okay. it for the past five years. He doesn't agree to do it for 1,000 here in Mysore. No, no. If you increase your numbers, if you increase okay. your numbers, Karkinos, Karkinos and Roche are ready to do yeah, it. And they do the high-risk screening Correct. also. Correct. Okay. So the pros and because the pros and cons of pap smear are always there. Yeah. So I think... Mm -hmm. uh, we will move ahead. Yeah. Yeah. 
So how is Dr. Padmaja, how is the PAP test res result interpreted? Very important. It's getting it done now, we have yes. to interpret it. Uh, yes, yes. <clears throat> Now, there has been a subtle changes in the terminology uh, from the year 1988 when it has been uh, introduced, madam. Uh, and, uh, uh, but grossly, what is, if the lower one third of the cells are involved, it is very mild disease. If the lower two thirds are involved, it is moderate. More than two thirds, it is severe disease. And hence the treatment varies. And the treatment varies depending on a lot, lot of the. Yeah. Somebody needs to mute. Please mute. 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 Everyone of you, please mute. Yes. Uh, current, current, yes. Uh, currently, what we are following is the Bethesda updated WHO. Uh, I will just come because there is there can be difference in the reporting system of the pathologist depending on what they are used to. Uh, the uh, earliest or the first one is the uh, native intraepithelial lesion or neoplasia. Yeah. Uh, for uh, negative intraepithelial lesion or malignancy. So they, these are the cells. When the slide shows no cells with cellular changes or inflammation, this is the NILM. Yeah, so basically, the, we have to go by the Betsida system. We need to ask our yes, pathologist that system. is what the standard of care is nowadays. Yes, because yes. that is updated WHO system. Yes, yes. And that's what Thank we you. need to follow. Yeah, I think are, let's move LSA a little faster. Yeah, yeah. I hope the panelists uh, don't mind. Dr. Aruna, please yeah. go ahead. Yes. What are the limitations of PAP? Dr. Geeta? Yeah. Uh, Point-wise, please. Yes, please be short. <laughs> so yeah, we can yeah, yeah. yeah, PAP depends on the quality of the smear. And so it has got a, a poor sensitivity, but high specificity. So there is a chance that we are going to miss a, a quite a few cases of uh, mm -hmm. there may be false negative. So uh, um, false positivity may be things. So yeah, uh, high. So there are high. Of, uh, it needs to be uh, the needs the cells need yeah. some time so and it needs to be repeated every three you cannot uh, see the probably that uh, get it so it will be difficult to do in, in such patients mm -hmm. but still in spite of all that pap smear still remains the mainstay of uh, screening Am I Arch pap smear when to start and how often Hello? do we do Dr. Archana Hello? 21 years and above 65 years not to do 21 to 30 years every three years and 30 to 65 years it is every three years when it is pap test and when it is hpv we are having a good margin and every five years it is enough yeah thank you but 21 cool. years do we start in india i think it is 25 as recommended by it's not 21 madam it's 21 yeah, not we start after that depending it's written 21 to 30 years pap smear that's what i'm saying even pap is recommended 25 25 yeah. 25 25 of lbc yes score over the pap smear Yes, uh, liquid based um, cytology it uh, scores in this uh, in the way that the quality of the smear is much better, the background will be more clear, unnecessary cells will not be there, and uh, uh, actually the sample is taken and put inside a thin prep vial, mm. and uh, the unnecessary cells can be filtered, and it can be also used for reflex testing. So in this way, liquid based uh, cytology scores over the conventional method. Thank you. So what, how do you manage following screening? Uh, Dr. Leela has very wonderfully told us. Yeah. So we'll just run through this. <laughs> yes, yes. Dr. Chandra? Yeah, when it uh, when the results are positive and we divide into it is negative, then it's then a rescan after three years. When whether it is uh, low grade or high grade ascus or more than ascus, directly we can go into colposcopy. If it is uh, doubtful only, then we get we have to do triage, screen, triage, and then treat. So even with triage, if it is negative, then again leave it and then reach can after three years. If it is positive, then go for palposcopy, then treatment accordingly. Yeah, thank you, madam. Dr. Rupa, what does yeah. the reason guidelines say? Guidelines says that we have to do co-testing. 
that's the best mm. pap smear with uh, hpv testing <laughs> Mm-hmm. which is most Dr. accurate than every is, five years uh, high risk hpv dna yeah every five years that's the wh yeah. depending on the resources available as per i think we'll have to modify that yes 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 so which method dr prabha if you are there all right with your uh, voice because there are many numerous the market has been flooded with lot of hpv tests everyone comes and tells us and yeah. each one has got a very high cost around it yeah. so what would you say anybody can take the question if prabha is not there Dr. Archana, Dr. Rupa, Dr. Geeta, Dr. Amruta. Anybody, please? Uh, the problem is that testing widely used is that most of them are not standardized. Yes. So, um, if the standardized ones like um, Hobas and uh, Onco- Onclarity, now they have the provision for uh, doing and genotyping also. Yes. So, whatever is available yes. and standardized, I think it should be done. Yeah, this is what I use. Kobas, yeah. Kobas 4800 by Roche. Which is, yeah, we're by Roche and that is what yeah. I am getting at a very subsidized rate. Yes, I think yes. all gynecologists and societies need to talk to them, give them more numbers, they will come down in the price because yes. I have been successful in that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm it. passing on the benefit. So yes. what is the uh, HPV? Self-sampling kits, as Dr. Leela, Madam, already told, Kerala has been doing a wonderful program on this and this has picked up in a very big way. And I think we need to present this also to our women who are very apprehensive to get it done sometimes. And gynecologists, mm-hmm. this study was done in Kerala, I think, where all gynecologists were given a kit of the help, uh, self-help, self-testing kit and they came back with the reports. Mm-hmm. So the pros and cons, it's all tests don't come without any advantages or disadvantages. Dr. Padmaja? Uh, yes, uh, we have to remember one thing that HPV uh, DNA testing mm-hmm. predicts only that uh, the, the woman is infected with HPV. HPV. It doesn't predict that she will develop cancer or uh, or any other precancerous lesion. And another thing very important is 90% of the HPV infected women revert back to normal because if the body is uh, healing, unless they are immunocompromised or whatever, uh, only 10% of them uh, progress uh, into mm. the cancer or precancer lesion, depending upon the HPV serotype which they're which they're infected. So because uh, once they're uh, tested as HPV positive, there is always chances of unnecessary anxiety of the patient, of the doctor, of more interventions, more risk of surgical intervention mm. and over treatment. These are all the risks of uh, uh, the of, of a woman diagnosed to be H- HPV positive. Another thing is. It only diagnoses the HPV infection yes. at the time of testing, not either the past or does it not, neither does it predict the uh, infection. Uh, and uh, it also does not throw a light on the abnormal cells or the cellular changes which mm. happened in the cervix at that moment of time. Uh, yeah. Therefore, uh, hence, we, once HPV DNA positive, these women always should be subjected to further testing for the cellular changes in the cervix. Yeah. So, Dr. Along ma'am, with sorry, the, to, sorry to the stop, ma'am. Shall we stop? Uh, but, yeah, but I know. No, if I stop this, ma'am, we can just take, take home messages and we can end, ma'am. Yeah. So I'll separate. just go to the, because the Dr. Leela has very wonderfully put this, recommended, Madam has put this, the VIA and VI Billy in the low resource setting. So, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, Madam has told us that we can go ahead and how do we follow? So, we will just move to the... Hello. Ah, yes, madam. Prabha. Yeah, sorry. Something has went wrong with my spine. Your, your earphones, I think. So, well, yeah. just to uh, for completion, Dr. Archana, what are the other methods available other than the regular PAP, VILI, YA and uh, HPV test? The messenger RNA, E6, E7, yes. the protein biomarkers, the mm-hmm. advantage is they are having, uh, uh, say, if it is... Uh, HPV tested and then also we can rule out and uh, but the cost is too high so it cannot be used as a screening method but the future is really good with less intervention we get more number of cases and more specific the protein biomarkers as well as the messenger RNA. Yeah. So and 16, 18, 34, death. 35 can be seen with yes. them. So this madam has already spoken. So we're just cupping the protocol for her and what we do after that, the place of core testing, I'm not going to go into that. So when do we stop screening, Dr. Padmaja? Yeah, uh, to put it short, we can stop screening if the previous PAPs have all been normal. We can stop screening by the age of 65. 
if the women had any uh, if the women had never any done any pap smear earlier we need to do a proper uh, well predictive uh, pap smear at the age of 65 and if it is negative we can just avoid, uh, avoid any uh, further screening or anything we can we can tell her as a result she doesn't need any screen for that but if it is positive we need to uh, go ahead with the standard protocol yeah, uh, for hysterectomized patient yes please. i wanted that point yeah yeah for for hysterectomized uh, patient first of all if a patient comes with the uh, telling that she has undergone hysterectomy we should be very sure whether it is subtotal where the cervix has been retained or it's a total hysterectomy where the cervix has been removed and we have to confirm with the reports and her histopathology report uh, if the histopathology report of her specimen uh, at the time of hysterectomy uh, shows it has uh, something like a sin lesion or something then she has to be subjected to a, a cytological evaluation and hpv testing at the end of 6 months and at the end of 18 months uh, if nothing is there i mean in the histopathology so the cervix is normal or something like that it, it has been done for some other indication like fibroids or something else where the cervix is normal then we can just say you just don't need to uh, any screening but she can always come back if she has any symptoms because other things like a vaginal cancer or vulval cancer uh, can be there in the rare occasions yeah, if the she point has is bleeding baby she needs it even if they have hysterectomy kindly do a clinical examination of the uh, perineum yes. and the vulva and the vagina irrespective of their age and irrespective of yes. their hysterectomy because most often they will not have their reports yeah yes, we must miss it as a gynecologist never to miss a yes. lesion in the vulva vagina vault yes yes yeah. so we know that cervical screening whatever has to be done and we can prevent cervical cancer and so whatever the barriers we do have so at last point i would like the panelists and the experts to give their take home last one message from each one at least do some kind of screening whatever possible whether it's hpv cytology or vi it doesn't matter at least do a speculum if not yes. i mean that is something which we should train even our uh, primary health center workers healthcare workers that's what we yes. see take the opportunity to uh, of the ca cervix patients family to you know uh, uh, to spread the awareness about this vaccination and preventive measures in the society because the sufferers can uh, become a more propagators for the preventive measures this is what i do in my practice that's the money it is each, each one teach one yes so you yeah. teach one person and tell them to tell their friends and relatives to go ahead with screening and vaccination everything they should do so teach each one should teach one yes yeah, screen each and every one who comes for some other uh, purpose also it to your clinic and uh, mothers of uh, pre delivery patients everybody and the quickly make awareness and take a uh, screening for them yes. Dr. Sarina, Madam, as an expert, I would like you and Dr. Aruna Suman to conclude the panel. I thank yeah. all my panelists and the organizers for giving us the opportunity. And sorry of taking about uh, seven minutes extra. Yeah. First of all, I must say uh, it's a good show, Dr. Priyankur and Dr. Monica, excellent moderators, Dr. Bharti and Dr. Aruna, and all the panelists. If I'm going to be very harsh, I must say one statement. Time has probably come. and it will come shortly we'll be dropping the uh, pap smears and we must take up the hpv dna testing which has got more sensitivity we should arrange at least for two hpv dna testing in a woman's lifetime and we should also arrange proper collection centers see it is not enough if the woman um, the doctor takes the tests they they should the lab should arrange collection centers so that they pick up the, the specimens and take it to the labs and probably i should say that in the last couple of years we have done an excellent job in giving the vaccination training our people in the screening programs and i think this gaining in momentum has probably been because of the work of people like the public awareness committee of foxy so hats off to you all it is really gaining momentum and time has come that the, everyone will learn about it and ask more questions and we will have more answers for them thank you 
Thank you, madam. Thank you, Serena, thank ma'am, you, madam. for giving us such a good uh, take-home messages. And I sincerely thank Bharati Rashekar, madam, for making such <laughs> an excellent PPT <laughs> with practical <laughs> problems and solutions also. And I thank all the panelists yeah. and I thank the organizers, Priyankur and Alka Pandey, madam, also for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Aruna. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, everybody. everybody. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank, thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, Thank you, Sarina, ma'am. Dr. Monica, uh, over to you. Thank you for the, really, the really extra really time, really Priyanka. Really Thanks for the extra time. Very beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Wonderful, Bharti. It was a very good Thanks, show. Rupa. Thank you. Thanks, thank Rupa. you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Rupa. Thank you, Bharti, madam. And uh, I apologize for my uh, technical hitch. You no, know, no problem. It always happens. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent slides, madam. Thank excellent, you. Excellent. Excellent. It was really very, very, very informative. informative. It's yeah. very informative. And it, it, it uh, makes, even even though you can put those slides in our clinics. And I think, Bharti, madam, you are supposed to give us one uh, the she local should. language. And even she, should. she should. She okay. should. Yeah, you didn't she see that. Sorry. Yeah, yeah this is the last one. The last but one she slide, the madam showed. I, think, I will yeah. send you, you the soft copy. I will take from her uh, after that. I'll send you the soft copy. It's in Canada. Two yeah. pages. Congratulations. Congratulations, Congratulations Bharti. For, uh, CSRV screening and vaccination. Yeah. Very nice. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Bharti, ma'am. That was indeed an excellent uh, presentation. Thank you, Aruna, ma'am. Thank you, Sarina, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. And oh, uh, thank you, yeah, yeah. panelists. We'll move on to the next session now. The next panel is on uh, modalities of conservative management of CA cervix. Uh, we have our moderators in Dr. Raghavendra sir and Dr. Kidanai ma'am. Our expert panelist for the session is Dr. Manjula ma'am. Uh, can we have the slide please? Abhishek? Yes. Yeah. Dr. Kidanai is, ma'am is, yeah, good evening ma'am. Good evening ma'am. She is the professor in OBGY at GMC Vanaparty and uh, at Kaloji University of Health Sciences, Telangana. Uh, she, she is the current chairperson of the FOXI uh, No Say No to Violence Against Women Committee till 2025, and also a core member of the... I think that, that would be enough. We are already running late. Uh, yes, ma'am. Welcome. Yeah. Next slide, please. Uh, our next uh, moderator is Dr. Raghavendra, sir. He is, of course, our South Zone Coordinator for the Public Awareness Committee and Director of Infertility and Fetal Maternal Unit at Sunrise Hospital. Welcome, sir. Yeah, and our expert panelist is Dr. Manjula uh, Anagani, ma'am. Uh, ma'am is, is MD, FICOG and, uh, and a Padma Shri Awardee in 2015. He's a co-founder for Pratyusha Support and NGO and uh, also a Guinness uh, record holder for the highest number of fibroids removed in a single patient. Welcome, Manjula, ma'am. Really, Thank really you. looking forward to your yeah. comments. Thank you. Yeah, can we have the please, Abhishek? Yeah. Uh, yeah, CV slides, please. We welcome our esteemed panelists. Our first panelist is uh, uh, Captain T. Sesha Sai. Uh, sir has worked in Army as a captain for five years, and he is also the NSS program officer at SV Medical College, Tirupati and has been practicing in Tirupati for over 20 years. We welcome you, sir. Next slide, please. Yeah. Our next uh, panelist is Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Maya Malia, madam. He, she is the current president of KOGS, uh, and she's trained in laparoscopy, gynae surgery, as well as colposcopy. We welcome you, Maya, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Our next panelist is Dr. Yeah. Our next panelist is Dr. K. Sunita, ma'am. Ma'am is the Associate Professor at SV Medical College, Tirupati, and uh, she has over six publications to her credit, and she has undergone various trainings in hysterolaparoscopies. Welcome, Sunita, ma'am. Our next panelist is uh, Dr. Sandhya Rani, ma'am. She is the Director and Chief Consultant at Lakshmi Narasimha Hospital and Ekashila Hospital, Hanumanakonda. Uh, she is also a member of FOXI and current member of WOGS. Welcome, uh, Sandhya, ma'am. Our next panelist is Dr. Aparna uh, Anil Watamwar, ma'am. Uh, she uh, is currently, she's trained in FMAS at World Laparoscopy Center, Delhi, and worked as an assistant in Government Medical College, Mehboob Nagar, from 2017 to 2020. At present, consultant and head at Anil Surgicare Hospital, Mehboob Nagar. Thank Welcome, you, Aparna, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Our next uh, panelist, Dr. Swati Rathod, ma'am. The professor in Department of Obs and Gynecology at Christian Medical College, Vellore. Uh, 
she has various affiliation uh, affiliations and publications to her credit and the special interest is in maternal and fetal medicine and high risk pregnancy welcome swati ma'am our next uh, panelist is dr mariam uh, iftikar ma'am Uh, ma'am is the associate professor at uh, in gynecological oncology in department of oncology and laparoscopic robotic surgeon at uh, yenpoya medical college and hospital mangalore uh, welcome mariam ma'am yeah thank you thank you welcome and uh, we have next uh, dr ramya ma'am she is currently assistant professor in department of obgy at yenpoya medical college mangalore and her areas of specialization is minimally invasive surgery and urogynecology welcome ramya ma'am yes uh, a warm welcome to all the panelists i now uh, will request uh, ma'am to uh, to kindly start with the uh, panel discussion please dr raghavendra sir have you joined sir i guess sir is uh, stuck with some emergency ma'am i would request you to start then sir will join us in the meanwhile and uh, in case uh, dr raghavendra sir is not there i'll uh, i think i'll entrust this responsibility to dr monica uh, because She'll join in emergency. Yes, ma'am. Monica will join, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. So, uh, first of all, okay. um, over to you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, am I audible, ma'am? Yes, ma'am. You are audible. Yes, ma'am. So I think we are definitely late, but uh, excellent session uh, of the public awareness committee. Happy congratulations to the anchor, Dr. Bharti, Dr. Shetabdi, Dr. Monica. Wonderful uh, efforts, and uh, both the sessions were uh, extremely good. and uh, thank foxy uh, our president uh, shishikesh sir our vice president al kamandam and all and uh, i see that our panelists are uh, really hand uh, picked and chosen uh, all are experts in the field and we uh, have the additional benefit of having uh, my dear friend senior dr manjula uh, padmashri dr manjula who has uh, wonderful experience and uh, she is a real expert thanks uh, dr manju thank you thank you kiran thank you for having me so my job is easy i would say uh, anyway, i'll start and i think uh, we have to not rush but uh, definitely we'll go for a crisp uh, question answer session uh, is it audible is it visible no ma'am not yet okay, yes, not ma yet ma'am uh, my net connection is some problem it seems stuck ma'am it shows that you have started the screen sharing but not visible yet oh yeah is it okay now oh uh, not yet ma'am yeah let me try again i'll stop my video for a while yeah yes ma'am yeah Sorry. is it visible now Yes, ma'am. It is visible. Just make it a screen show, yes. a slide show. Sorry. Uh, on the bottom side, uh, yeah, there seems to be some lag uh, on the internet from my side. Yes, ma'am. Clear, ma'am. So let's uh, move on. Uh, I mean, move ahead of the facts and the burden of disease and the importance of screening, how it affects, and you know, we all know the ninety seventy uh, ninety goal. and it is definitely our uh, responsibility we can no longer run away from this uh, we also know that there are basically primary three primary screening methods hpv dna as i find the final message is we are moving towards hpv dna moving away from pap smear and in low resource setting it is mostly the via VL, uh, vili that is c and treat approach so the first case i would go ahead uh, is uh, she is a young woman 35 years uh, g2a1 Uh, still not having children who is complain who has come to our opd with white discharge and apparently the examination the per abdomen per speculum pv examination is normal and the pap smear showed the bethesda is what we have to follow that is hsil uh, so now what will you do what next uh, do you want to triage or do you want to just uh, treat her uh, immediately or follow up uh, can i have uh, one of the panelists either dr malia maya or dr sunita or dr sanjay anyone can take this question shall i take i am dr yes. maya yes 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 dr actually because of uh, during pregnancy because of uh, increased uh, vascularity and some hormonal changes she is not pregnant ma'am she is not ah. she is not but gravidar 2 it is written no, sorry no no this is 
uh, let me correct this. Uh, she is not uh, pregnant. She is desirous of uh, pregnancy. Okay. Yeah. So if she is not pregnant, we can uh, go for uh, this one, uh, colposcopy. And we can see under colposcopy guided, we can do, go for a biopsy also. Okay. So uh, Dr. Maya would like to go for a colposcopy. That is, she want to triage and then uh, go for a... Colposcopy guided biopsy under VIA or uh, colposcopy guided biopsy will be better for this patient. So WHO says that it is a screen and treat approach or screen triage and treat approach. If it is a single visit or multiple visit depending upon the resource settings. So yes. again, uh, based on the WHO guidelines, uh, because cytology is being used as a primary screening test here. So Dr. Maya says we'll have a colposcopy, then depending on the colposcopy triage, biopsy, and then treatment. Uh, any other investigations that uh, you would like to have? We HP, have the, HP, yeah. HPV uh, we can do because nowadays, because of increased sensitivity, it says that uh, sensitivity is uh, more in HPV test. So, and specificity also. So, we will go for a HPV test also. Dr. Manjula? Yep, I would definitely go for a HPV liquid. We co-testing is the need for the day, especially with HSIL. Uh, because that will determine me, uh, tell me what I should be doing for her. Because with pregnancy, we know it can actually uh, go more faster, the progress of the disease. Sorry, so, I would go... Uh, she's not pregnant. Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. I understand. I understand. But next, she'll be become pregnant. So I need to be very clear about it. So I would definitely go for co-testing and then discuss with her the options and then uh, go for the treatment part of it. Okay. Uh, okay. Then uh, role of uh, colposcopy. Colposcopy, colposcopy uh, guided biopsy is definitely uh, mm -hmm. advisable. And co-testing, that is the reason I said we would be going for co-testing both for HPV plus colposcopy guided uh, biopsy. Okay. So any anybody else, Dr. Sunita, uh, you would uh, like to tell us about uh, the colposcopy, not basically the entire procedure, but uh, very briefly about it. What are the advantages and uh, do we have Dr. Sunita here? I can take the I can take the question, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, so basically, the indications of colposcopy will be like anything apart from pap smear normal and ascus, which is HPV negative after triaging. We'll definitely mm -hmm. go all the other things. We'll go for colposcopy, like BLC, let's see, right. ASK, AG, CNOC, and endocarcinoma, AIS. So everything except normal pap smear, as well as uh, ASK, uh, ASCUS, which is HPV negative, will go for colposcopy. So it goes for the indications of colposcopy. Apart from that, the idea of doing it is to evaluate where is the lesion, which quadrant it is, to see the extent as well as the grade of the lesion. And we go for a colposcopic directed biopsy, we will go. Uh, okay. Again, we can follow modified reads index as well as squeeze scoring, depending upon that uh, before the management is there. And we can for any of the guidelines. We have ACP guidelines, which clearly gives the flow charts for all the practitioners. Sitting in the OPD, you just have to search in the Google, put in the ACP guidelines, and that gives you a beautiful flow chart of what has to be done where, even if it's pregnant, less than 25, more than 25. Yep. Yeah. Now, so uh, what is considered an adequate uh, colposcopy? Aware that uh, uh, squamoculmar junction is uh, properly visible and uh, uh, that is TZ1. Okay. TZ1. That, that's the proper, that area, when and we should see uh, periphery also very clearly, if possible, vagina also. Yeah. So, this was an adequate colposcopy and endocervical curatage. Do you uh, all do go for endocervical curatage in this case? For example, this was an HSIL apparently in normal cervix. Absolutely. Yes, Endo, no endocervical keratage is a must. Is a must. So it is normal and the biopsy had come to be uh, CIN2. Now what next? CIN2. Yeah, uh, we can go for any of the uh, thermoablation method or uh, yeah. whatever is available. Uh, so any uh, Dr. Maya says uh, thermablation. This is the flowchart that I have taken from the Foxy GCPR 2018. Yeah, uh, Dr. Kiran, I can add something here. Yes, yes, yes. yes. No. Leela, ma'am, is it Dr. Leela? Yeah, yeah. Yes, no, ma'am. You are saying that the biopsy is uh, showing CIN2. Am I right? Right. Yeah. So uh, actually now uh, there is a change in the terminology of uh, 
this uh, CIN. No longer they are using CIN. They are using either LCL or HCL. But okay, even if you have used CIN2, CIN2 is actually a gray area. Hmm. So in this particular situations, when you get a BAPS report of CIN2, uh, the one of the advantage, I mean, like the latest advances in uh, good centers is they do IHC, that is immunohistochemistry right. for P16. Yeah. Okay. So KI67. If immunohistochemistry yeah. huh. shows positivity, that is the block positivity, that means the entire abnormal area is picked up by IHC markers, then yeah. you have to consider it as a high grade. Uh, that means the chance of it becoming a higher grade or progression is uh, more. If it IHC is negative, then uh, you can consider it used towards a lower grade. Uh, so uh, Leela, ma'am, in case I don't have this facility of immunohistochemistry. Yes. And if you don't have the facility, that is okay. Then you have to individualize according to the history and everything. But if you have a facility, you can do uh, IHC. No, uh, but you said the lady is uh -huh. is only desirous of pregnancy. Yeah. So the, even uh, follow up is also an acceptable option. That's what I wanted to ask. Yep. One is a follow up. The other is triaging, as you have said, with uh, immunohistochemistry, if it is CIN2. Uh, and going ahead with an excisional procedure. All the three are acceptable. Is it so? Yeah, I mean, in this particular lady, yeah, CIN2 and the entire transformation zone is visible in this patient. Hmm. Uh, and uh, the one advantage of this IHC is if it is not a, a IHC positive, if it is a lower grade, then you can even think of an ablative treatment. That is an advantage. That is an advantage. If you want to consider treatment for this lady, if it is IHC positive, then probably uh, you may uh, think twice before going for ablation. But anyway, if somebody is keen for pregnancy and all, maybe you should not uh, straight away jump and do excisional methods. And here the picture what you have shown has nicely showing a type 1 teaser. The entire lesion is visible on the ectocervix. So ablation is still possible. possible. And of course, follow-up is another option in CIN2. Also, there is a chance of regression. Hmm. But it, she has to be on a very close, um, close follow-up. Yeah. So, Madam, but in ablation, you won't uh, get the issue, issue for uh, examination. Yeah, one of the, uh, already biopsy has been done. have already done the biopsy. And you have said it is CIN2. If you have not right. done the biopsy, then you won't get uh, any biopsy. Any histopathological report in uh, ablation. Okay. So, can anybody uh, tell in brief about uh, cryotherapy, the procedure, its advantages, disadvantages? Dr. Sunita, you can go ahead. Anyway. Yes. The cryotherapy is usually done with uh, nitrous oxide. It is uh, freezing of the tissues. Usually, we use three minutes, five minutes, and three minutes freeze the and freeze technique. But there are some disadvantages. It should be. It is done in uh, uh, outpatient procedure only without any anesthesia. That is the advantage of the procedure. And uh, the what are the prerequisites? Just we have to go with our pap smear should be done prior itself. Yeah, we should uh, confirm the diagnosis, and it should be seen one or two lesions and uh, not going beyond that uh, transformation zone into the endocervical lesion yeah, cannot be one. there. Uh, all those things should be there before taking her for cryotherapy. But the complication with it is uh, excessive vagina, patient complaints of uh, excessive vaginal discharge, watery discharge, which is uh, yeah. causing inconvenience to the patient. Any complications? I think uh, minimal complications yeah, are with uh, cryotherapy. There are chances uh, of um, no chances of bleeding in this patient. And watery discharge is the only complication we'll get. Uh, can I uh, have you know, uh, Dr. Leela, madam, and uh, previously also, uh, there was so much talk about this thermal ablation. Uh, right. Can someone tell about the principle and its major, major uh, advantages right now? Because in the CN treat uh, approach in low resource settings, we are employing VILI or VIA and then Immediately when paramedical trained staff nurses are doing this at the same sitting, thermal ablation. Then we have um, Dr. Aparna or Dr. Swati, Dr. Ramya, who have not uh, in part till now. So we have Dr. Swati here. 
or anyone any one of you please usually the can i tell that usually the probe will be um, that uh, uh, the temperature will be reduced to minus 50 degrees and then uh, either nitrous oxide or carbon dioxide is uh, the gas is passed through the probe and when it touches the no, that is about cryotherapy that is about cryo uh, okay. Thermal regulation uh, has got two companies like Vysap and Zepro. Yes, so they have got these three probes of different different sizes. So you can cover that lesion, mm -hmm. and uh, where the temperature is increased, it has got a beep sound. So initially, when you put in the probe, uh, it has got a button where you, after you insert and you have the target lesion pressed on the cervix. It's so again OPD procedures. It is uh, uh, um, OPD and it is painless. So once you are inside and you're touching the cervix with the probe, depending upon the size, you three different probes. So once you're inside, you press the button and then it beeps or it has a light once it reaches the 100 degree. Uh, yeah. And then again, you have a beep, which uh, it, it calms down, it cools down and then you remove the probe out. And uh, this is battery operated, so you can carry it at the camp settings. Uh, it is portable and it's a very small box, like, you know, hardly like about like 30 centimeters small box. Uh, so you can immediately do the screen and treat in this thermal ablation. Only disadvantage is that you will not get a, like, uh, unlike a cone biopsy and leaf, you will not get a biopsy, like a tissue specimen as such. Uh, so you have to make sure that we are dealing with the low-grade lesion, which is HPV negative or say P16 or P67 negative. Uh, yeah. It is advantageous over the cryotherapy. I would yes. like to ask uh, either Neela Madam or um, Dr. Manjula here. Yeah. Right, the advantage, Kiran, here is that it is a very short setting, like, you know, 20 to 40 second cycles and repeatedly you can use. That is the thing. That is Ma'am, whether in HPV positive, we should not use it. Huh? No, it's not like HPV positive, you cannot use it. It can be yes. used as long as it is the LSIL okay. or yes, SSIL. Yes. Only okay. says in C and treat, uh, wherein they are doing a VIA uh, with acetic acid and they are ablating these lesions, uh, so, before doing thermal ablation, a biopsy is a must. Yes. Uh, Leela, we need to have a biopsy. We need to have a biopsy. Screen and treat approach, we, we sometimes don't do biopsy. Biopsy. So, yes. in screen and uh, treat approach using VIA or HPV testing. So, even if you do HPV testing, you have seen the lesion, you have to see the acetal whiteness. So, suppose if it is a thin acetal white, the lesion is uh, with a uh, diffuse borders. There is no abnormality. Uh, they mean, there is no vascular abnormality and other things. So you can uh, use a, a thermal ablation. It is in place of cryo. So cryo and thermal ablation can be done in uh, a positive uh, you can definitely do it without a biopsy. Without a biopsy. If you have a suspicion that uh, maybe she's harboring See, a high grade my, lesion, my doubt and then question. Uh, you have to do a No, is there a chance of missing uh, malignancy if you are not taking biopsy? If Even if it is a remote chance, in case we are not taking biopsy in low resource settings. Then, there can be over treatment, there can be under treatment. I don't okay. deny that there can be always over treatment. So but it all depends on how uh, experience you are doing in uh, VIA interpretation. So that is the that is the one which matters. Of course, if you have the facility to do biopsy for uh, every woman, you can do it. Yes, yes. So in the case of a low resource setting uh, or in case where we are not able to do a biopsy, that should not deter us from green and treat approach. Yeah. Yes. Screening. Can, can anyone, uh, any of the panelists? Uh, yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. We got the message. So regarding uh, LEAP, that is loop electrosurgical excision procedure, what is it and what are the advantages or disadvantages and what is the setting that uh, uh, setup that we have, that we need? Anybody? This so, uh, which we can use, of course. Loop electrosurgical excision procedures usually uh, utilizes this electric wire, remove the chunk of the suspected tissue from the cervix. And it needs the local uh, anesthesia. At least we'll do, we'll give a cervical uh, block and then we'll be taking in our uh, hospital. 
Uh, we don't go for general anesthesia and other things, short general, but local anesthesia is enough to take that uh, area of uh, lesion from the cervix. What additional advantages, uh, Dr. Sunita, apart from getting the sample for HPE? Additional, you can uh, reduce the burden of the disease from the cervix also, no? You can remove that the area of uh, affected area. Yes, the lesion extending to the endocervical region can also be removed yeah. with this uh, leaf. Yeah, in that type. case, we have to go with the large loop excision of the transformation zone. You can yeah. also go uh, with legs. Dr. Dr. Manju, I want you to yes. elaborate on this leap and legs. How the different leap, are they? Yeah, uh, leap is something where we have a small electrical loop through which we remove the complete uh, the abnormal cells from the cervix. So this is something like uh, Dr. Maya and everybody said that it is for biopsy and then through which we can go and then remove it. But one thing we need to understand is that if you are doing an OP setting and uh, we are not using anything else uh, to be doing it, the bleeding chance of bleeding will be there even though whenever we are doing it. So we might, we might have to go in for thing. But let's is a large loop exercise of the transformation zone. That's where definitely the endocervical area and the transformation zone is definitely taken, a larger loop. Whereas leap, most of it is just the superficial cells and the abnormal cells which we see till we are not very sure that we would be going into the endocervical region. So both very are rarely we see, madam, bleeding. Yeah. Bleeding pervasion yeah. rarely we come across. Yes, yes. If it is, we are going with leap, it is much lesser. But with let's, we do see, especially when the cases where uh, you see a lot of um, raw area and abnormal uh, tissues there and colposcopy showing a lot of vascular abnormalities there, that's okay. where the bleeding is going to be more. Okay. So how frequently have you seen these uh, complications like cervical stenosis or uh, yeah. cervical yeah. Stenosis is something which we see more with let's than with leap. That is first thing. And the second thing is when it is, um, when we talk about the uh, incompetence, that happens only when we go very high cone or when we reach almost to the internal os. Otherwise, incompetence is usually not much seen with leap or legs. So it is mostly the stenosis and if you are really yeah. going uh, deeper. Anybody yeah, and as with, or... as with cryocautery, even with leap and legs, there will be a lot of watery discharge for the first two weeks, which we have to counsel. Okay. Anybody uh, experienced with this cold knife phonization, the number of cases you are experienced, where, where uh, you do use this uh, cold knife phonization as a conservative, uh, you know. Dr. Mariam or if Dr. Swati is here. Dr. Sesha Sai, sir. I have no experience with cold knife phonization. I do cold knife phonization. Uh, yes, yeah. It is with the scalp and uh, you uh, you remove the cone. Uh, it is uh, more useful and comes to type 2 and type 3 where you have a uh, inadequate uh, colposcopy or say uh, when the transformation zone is receded inside in that cases. And those who do not want hysterectomy like syn 2, syn 3 lesions, uh, you know, in that cases we do a cold knife coneization. Advantage here is that uh, you do it along with the ECC as well. When we do this cone, mm -hmm. actually we also do an ECC, yeah, endocervical cure attach. And the advantage is that, uh, yeah, we get a tissue, good uh, tissue for biopsy, make sure that margins are negative. And again, it is also one of the, this one where uh, you have a, a, a early CHRVX1, it also can be a CHRVX1 who desires of fertility. This is also along with versus that is the micro -micro part. Yeah, yeah. yeah. micro-micro-invasive, like, you know. Uh, so that is also one of the indication for cone biopsy. We do cases here. There are people yeah. who come here telling that we want to preserve uterus, even though they are 40, 45, telling that. Uh, we want to preserve this into synthesis. We want to, in that cases, I go for cold knife. Of course, now, uh, even if she is a 40 year old lady with yeah. micro invasive cancer and if desirous of no, 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 uh, desirous of the desirous of fertility, then that's option or option. But yeah. radical symptom is always preferred yes. over this yes. one. Any other yeah, I would like to is. just add yeah. one more sentence yes. to what uh, Dr. Maya is saying. We do a lot of conizations because we still strongly believe that any infection is definitely not an indication for hysterectomy unless it is that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. whenever there is unsatisfactory cold cup, findings or when there's positive endocervical cutage or biopsy usually is when it comes you know it's not invasive micro invasion or anything that's when again like dr maya said when we cannot when the lady wants to save the uterus we go now one thing what i wanted to add here is all these cases we started doing a practice of suturing 
on both the um, in the descending cervicals and even anterior posterior. That prevents the bleeding. The amount of bleeding you see with cold knife is definitely quite high. We do know we need to have correct packing there. So once we started the practice of suturing on uh, at um, both all the four quadrants, both at 12, 3, 4, and uh, this thing and tying it up and then doing a cold knife, we do not have bleeding after the cold knife uh, conization. 12, 6, 3, and 9, ma'am. Yeah, you should just go 4 to 2 and we should again go from 10 to, uh, to uh, 11, that eight is uh, 8 yeah. to 10 and again yeah. um, 11 to 1 and again uh, this um, we get the 5 to 7 uh, and put it, take a suture. This makes it avascular and bleeding is avascular ready. and it is by vicryl which is absorbable and we do not have torrential bleeding which is the most dreaded complication of this conization thing. Uh, do you fashion the, I mean, cervix again with uh, cervical lips and all? If we do a good, if we do a good conization, we don't have to do anything. Okay. If with, with this suturing, when we do a good conization and go, we don't fashion anything. We just have to put a dilator so that there is the, um, the internet os is not going to be stenosed at the end of the procedure. To get the feel of the os, um, we just put the dilator. I would like to ask both Dr. Anjum and Dr. Manjula, how many cases of uh, cold knife colonization that you had done? Oh, I must have done more than 50, Kiran, definitely. Okay. Dr. Anjum? I'm around, uh, almost around 30, ma'am. Now I have decreased because initially we didn't have a thermal ablation. Now once mm. thermal ablation has come and I, have by, I prefer like thermal ablation like much more. Okay. So let's go. Especially to for the young. Uh, thank you all, uh, really experts as panelists. Uh, so this is a 35-year-old again. Uh, pap smear shows malignant cells. Colposcopy was done and then they have done a uh, leap. And uh, the biopsy is uh, showing, I mean, it is a FIGO stage 1A CA cervix. But again, she wants to preserve her for repeat. So what next? Can anyone just run through the FIGO 2018 uh, staging uh, in very brief, uh, quickly? Dr. Sunita, Dr. Aparna, or uh, do, I don't think we have Dr. Swati or Dr. Seishasai, sir. I thought he logged in. Any one of you, please. Yeah, I can, uh, yeah. Yes, ma'am, quickly. Uh, so now the, yeah, now, now the staging has changed. I'm going to talk only very practical. I'm not going yes. to go into the details of it. So we have got, like, as a clinician, like, as a surgeon, what do we know that much? Only I'm going to tell it, ma'am. Yep. So we have got stage 1A, A1, A2. B hmm. has now, initially was B1, B2. Now, later staging has become B1, B2, B3. And then comes 2A and 2B. Now, beyond that is stage 3 onwards, 3A, 3B right. and 4. We all know that 4 is always distant match. So I'm just going to keep out of it. Now, in stage A1, A2, A1 is less than 3 and A2 is 3 to 5. But both are, again, microinvasive picked up from that smear. But no further, we'll subject them to colposcopy. Now, as clinicians, when we see in the gynec OPs, we see a lesion in the cervix. Now, how do we have to differentiate this? If it is less than 2 cm, it is B1. If it is more than 2 to 4, it is B2. Beyond 4, it is B3. So, yep. which are the ones we are sending immediately to a radiation oncologist? Any lesion which is beyond 4 cm, that is B3 onwards, also, if there is a vaginal involvement, it becomes 2A. If there's a parametrial involvement when you're doing a bio uh, examination, if there's a, a parametrial involvement, it becomes 2B, which is the optical pelvic side wall becomes 3B. So anything beyond 1B3 onwards, we'll send it to the we'll send it to the radiation oncologist and they will give a definitive RRT, radical RT, EBRT as well as bracket. So we as clinicians are interested in any lesion up till B2. Up till B2. And one up till B2. Now, one exception for this B3 is a young lady who is desirous, like who is not very keen on radiation. There are centers which B3, they give chemotherapy two or three cycles of Pacli Carbo, downsize the lesion, and take for radical hysterectomy. The idea behind avoiding this double modality is double, like radical surgery as well as radical radiation. To avoid that, we usually send them for adjuvant radiation that they have a single radical modality. But there are some young ladies who prefer surgery or radiation. In such cases, we can give Pacli Carbo and downsize in B3 lesion. That's all about it. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what stages are amenable for fertility sparing surgery? I, I, uh, this, I think I would like to take it. Early stage, we go stage 1A through to 1B2, like Dr. Anjum just now said. Till that, 
when the woman wants to have a fertility sparing surgery or reproductive age group where pathological uh, consistent definitely are with low risk and some squamous adeno or squamous adeno i think negative lymph nodes when we go and we can do a sentinel lymph node lymph nodes are negative with stage 1a1 to stage 1b2 till that i think we can still uh, so make it available for this uh, i want to clarify here is it 1b1 uh, or even 1b2 also manju uh, what what one A one, one A two, one B one, and one B two. Till that time, I think we can still go ahead with the um, the fertility sparing surgeries. Uh, sir, I see you, Doctor Shesha Sai. Sir, you would like Hello. to add here conservative uh, fertility sparing surgery in case of early. Uh, early, what she said is correct, madam. Yeah, it is adequate. Okay. So. Actually, we should be proud of uh, this 2018 uh, guidelines. One yeah. of our very own Dr. Neja Batla, Madam, is uh, you know the main force behind this, and even in the 2021 up update of the FIGO. So what FIGO says is in micro invasive disease that is 1A1, 1A2, uh, that is generally made on a cone biopsy or a leap or a cold knife, which should include the entire lesion, and the uh, as you know, the depth of invasion should not be greater than three or uh, five millimeters. So the treatment is, uh, I would like our experts to comment. Suppose this is 1A1. Hmm. As it is. She's 35 year old, 1A1. I think 1A1, I think we can go ahead with conization. With conization. Hmm. Okay. Any lymph node sampling here? See, with 1A1, the chance of lymph node is less than even 1%. I don't think we would be doing anything uh, which is... Uh, uh, can, can anyone, uh, Dr. Anjum or, uh, you know, comment on this lymph vascular space invasion? Uh, yeah, I mean, that is one thing. If it is evident, uh, the FIGO says pelvic lymphadenectomy should be considered. Yeah. Yes, we can go, ma'am. Like uh, for that, and now we have this minimal invasive. Uh, this one also, we can go through that and then do uh, this one. If LVSI is there, we can go ahead and do a retroperitoneal lymph node dissection as well. Pelvic lymph node dissection. That is, but we I, have I to do a sentinel lymph node first. Sentinel lymph node. Yeah, if available is there because not all centers have got all, uh, sentinel practical lymph node. purposes. One a one doesn't uh, mostly need. need. Uh, yeah, node. mostly doesn't need. And now, if sentinel facility is available in any center because not all centers have got either in lap or robo, which has got firefly. Or it's a lab which has got sentinel, then I think we can go ahead with the sentinel lymph node. Otherwise, they will go for that. It's a good LVSI positive. But anything 1A2 and B1, if we are doing, I think I would prefer radical trachelectomy with, yeah. as Madam told, Manjula, Madam told, uh, plus or minus something sentinel. Something which uh, I have, uh, I really don't uh, remember, you know, witnessing or assisting or doing. I would request uh, one of you to yeah. just like a we did, Yeah, we did do a lot. I did do uh, quite a few trachelectomies in most of these uh, international patients who come to us after subtotal hysterectomy, not just for CS cervix. They come ah. with only cervix with a lot of uh, uh, the vault uh, issues and a uh, lot of pain and everything, vault adenomyosis, the cervical issues. That's when we go ahead and do a minimally invasive um, trachelectomy is done. So the same thing when we do, but CA for, um, for a malignant Pregnancy, I have not done for any CIN, um, the 1A2 or anything like that. Because once we know that most of our patients, once there is a fear of cancer, they always opt for the, the radical surgeries or radiation. That is what they do. But otherwise, theoretically, it should be the same thing what we do with the radical uh, thing. Only thing that in simple trachelectomy, uh, we do not remove the parametrium. We just take it out like a co the cylinder type of a thing, which we take out the whole cervix. And uh, with radical, there is a parameter, uh, the parameter which is involved. So it can be both abdominal or even vaginal. Most of the trachelectomies, we just do a laparoscopic uh, um, guided vaginal surgeries. Okay, laparoscopically guided vaginal surgery. Doctor yeah, because when we do a radical uh, um, uh, trachelectomy, we remove the whole of the cervix and uh, then we have to do a utero-vaginal anastomosis. Hmm. Dr. Anjum, you would like to add? Yes, ma'am. Same, same here as well. Same as the procedure is as what Madam has told. But then, as such, uh, uh, people coming in uh, with the cervical, they would prefer going in for radical hysterectomy than uh, yeah. trachea. Like it's really a yeah, uh, uh, rare mm -hmm. scenario, I think, mm -hmm. in India because the fear of cancer is too much, uh, Kiran, in yeah. India. I, mean, I thought I was. Uh, I mean, this option was though I was reading. 
so mm. i just thought how many really undergo or do this uh, but but let me tell you a, a little uh, glorified conization is simple tra- trachelectomy so most of the time when we err on extra treating it ends up being a simple trachelectomy than uh, the only conization when we say high cone and when we go ahead true, true. most of the cervix it is as good as simple uh, trachelectomy yeah absolutely okay when uh, with conization or maybe radical trachelectomy i really don't know how many or how far we can discuss but uh, what would be the pregnancy outcome what will be okay. the post surgery kiran yeah yeah so i think we should be anticipating few things post surgery yeah, yeah. after we do anything yeah. one is like you said stenosis leading to yeah. infertility or insufficiency leading to second yeah. trimester yeah. this is something which we have to understand as a cervical factor can be there but chorioamnionitis subsequent pprom preterm labor these are also known to happen and but when we do a circlage and then continue most of the patients we can go till at least viability age in today's times i would like to ask again uh, we have real uh, experts who are do- dealing with this uh, onco cases uh, yeah. we have had experience with uh, pregnancy post uh, treatment of early ca cervix following i had only one case hmm. dr anjum dr Mal- maya uh, dr seesha sai sir what is it ma uh, can i have After the question this conservative uh, suppose conization for early any micro invasive or any uh, any pregnancy was there uh, which you had followed or i mean post post trachelectomy definitely no ma'am but then i think no, coronary no, no. as madam has to as madam has to i think anticipatory circulage can be done but uh, as such uh... okay so but it needs uh, this is an option the uh, conserving uh, you know the conservative surgeries and all for early stage cervical cancer who, for those who are desiring for future pregnancy actually anticipate circulage again it's not a mandatory thing but i'm sure yeah. there must be like precious pregnancy right delayed that is why all this thing and for that uh, it may need but actually as such it's not a per se an indication to do a circulage as such So what, uh, what i have uh, gleaned from the experts is uh, mostly it is the conization trachelectomy is not really that much practiced at least in the indian scenario but that is the option definitely described and uh, discussed in the guidelines and it requires careful selection counseling and then follow up with this uh, i hand over to dr monica for the third case dr monica Is she here? Uh, no, no. One second, ma'am. Monica, Monica, are you there? I, ma'am, she was. My, I wanted to just ask everybody there. Uh, uh, if once you do a like, like we were, we've been talking about CA cervix, and then we are looking at pregnancy, pregnancy. Okay, pregnancy is done. So, how many of you would be voting for hysterectomy after that? because the fear is still there because ah. she had a 1a2 or 1b1 or 1a whatever it is we have done a conization and then we finished her fertility then how many of you would be just following it up or how many of you would be actually uh, voting for <coughs> once the child bearing is complete definitely want to go for hysterectomy madam once the family is completed yeah i think we i think we all should be looking at again repeating hpv and if it's still high risk uh, yeah. so what, does the, what does the guideline say actually guideline say close follow up i think with close follow up with hpv and if it's it says that uh, if they remain positive for hpv definitely once child bearing is complete we but should be going for definitive uh, hysterectomy each with uh, ca yeah, uh, 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 um, demand uh, hysterectomy once the family yeah. is completed yeah. agree so demand is tracked one advantage is what i'm saying is we have a long period of amenable for follow up and different methods of uh, following up so mm. as long as patient is with us uh, i think that option also is there but again as dr manjula says maybe after completion of uh, family dr monica yeah. is not there shall i go ahead yeah please please go ahead <laughs> so this is a uh, pregnant and she's uh, also stuck somewhere ma'am please go carry on ma'am <laughs> everybody is stuck 20 weeks of gestation uh, again uh, it is showing a high grade uh, hsil now she's yep. 
Well, let's again uh, skip to, through this uh, theory part. Uh, what are the cytological changes uh, during pregnancy, which uh, you know, which may uh, kind of mimic? mimic. Uh, mm. There can be glandular hyperplasia. Yeah. Uh, in immature yeah, metaplasia, yeah. confused with cellular atypia, we can see. Even and increased the false positives, you'll be able to see on uh, examination. Alposcopy also, there is increased vascularization. Yeah, during pregnancy and uh, more severe lesions. But again, biopsy, it has got good uh, sensitivity and specificity. But again, with uh, complications, again, because she's pregnant. And mm. regarding the CECT, can we use in pregnancy? If no. no. Why can't we? Okay. With, with, uh, okay. Let me tell you one thing. How many ah. of you did uh, CECT in pregnancy in Corona? We all did it. And so I think just being careful and putting the um, lead shield and doing it is everything changes with time. Absolutely. We have learned so many things because of Corona. So we should not be shying away from Actually, doing it. Dose is just one CGI and the dose allowed is much more. Actually, if needed, mm. necessary, it can be done. That is. It can be done. Now, what is your plan in this case? She is a HSIL and 20 weeks. Precursor mm -hmm. is not. Uh, biopsy. Biopsy is telling what? HSIL only. HSIL. And then I think close follow up and then waiting to, uh, for her to deliver. That would be ideal unless it is now stage one A or something. But yeah. if it's HSIL, just uh, following. We need not rush and uh, you know do yeah. something early radical here. This is again from the Foxy GCPR. Uh, so low grade, it's just follow up with colposcopy at six weeks. High grade, repeat colposcopy at every trimester is what the yeah. general every three months rule out uh, invasive disease and again follow up in the uh, six weeks postpartum. Whereas in invasive cancer, it is again different. This is a precursor yeah. lesion. You are going to closely follow up every trimester, and generally they regress, is what they say. Uh, coming to the invasive uh, CA cervix, what would be your take? I think the discussion with the patient is very, very important. It's 20 weeks. If she wants a termination of pregnancy, I would go for it's a still early pregnancy. So terminate the pregnancy and then treat for mal malignancy. So it is like the cutoff is 20 weeks. If it is less than 20 weeks, the cancer takes the precedence. Yes. I mean, treatment of the malignancy is important, immediate and definitive treatment. Radical hysterectomy with fetus in situ with lymphadenectomy or radiotherapy and whatever it is. Whereas if it is more than 20 weeks, you can wait mm -hmm. till viability stage. Uh, viability or at least 32 weeks, 34 weeks and giving steroids and even yeah. in the classical section and then uh, radical hysterectomy. So these are mm -hmm. from the FIBO. Uh, and uh, actually it is also adv advised that we can do a radical hysterectomy at the time of cesarean. Yes, yes. I don't know how many of us have done because we have never done. So I but have no idea. It is, it is uh, given. I mean, it is. Yeah. The plan, as Dr. Manjula was said, telling, it has to be discussed with the patient. It is a multidisciplinary approach. So 15, before 20 weeks, they are treated without delay. And then uh, late trimester onwards, again, after delaying definitive treatment is an option for stages 1A2 and 1B1 and 1B2. It is not shown to have any negative impact on the prognosis compared to non-pregnant patients. In timing of uh, delivery, again, both medical interest. Again, classical section and radical hysterectomy is from the FIGO 2021 update. It can be undertaken at the same time, uh, not later than 34 weeks. Yep. And route of delivery, any contraindication for vaginal delivery? Oh, and, uh, I think if it's only conization or anything, we can, we can allow vaginal delivery. There is no other yeah. option. Anyway, the route of delivery doesn't matter. Pregnancy, any uh, regarding this conization in pregnancy, Manjula or uh, Anjula? No, 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 no. In pregnancy, we usually do not do anything of that sort. But um, mm -hmm. theoretically, leads and leaps can be done. Hmm. But anyway, uh, high grade, even HSIL also, we are going to follow up. Yeah, this just follow up. follow up. With colposcopy. With colposcopy. More okay. frequent. So if it is precursor lesion, then uh, vaginal delivery is definitely not uh, right. <laughs> go no. for it. Uh, Micro-invasive, there is some uh, suspicion of, uh, you know, disease progression and all, but uh, definitely we can have a vaginal delivery. Again, route of delivery will not actually matter. Maybe. Matter. Uh, but yeah. anyway, advanced or, uh, you know, later stages, maybe cesarean section. We have to go for cesarean. Uh, cesarean and just now we spoke about cesarean radical. Oh, so I think radical. we should think of that if it's an advised, advanced. Yeah. Okay. 
so the, there ends uh, the panel i'm i think i'm lucky really lucky to have uh, all of you especially thanks thank manju thank you wow, thank you kiran it was a wonderful uh, uh, i just got all my answers from the experts no no no, no, no. Really you <laughs> thank you said i could not say no <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, you dr kiran mai and thank you dr manjula mai thank you happy thank to you be with you dr manjula thank you manjula mai thank, thank, thank you kiran mai thank, thank you all yeah, of thank you thank you it was a very good, good yeah thank you you were great academic session yeah ma'am thank you ma'am it was a good thank you all family thank you sesh sai sir thank you madam party was there but i don't know Thank you, Kiran Mai, ma'am. Thank you, Kiran Mai, ma'am, and heartfelt thanks to Manjula, ma'am, Maya, ma'am, Anju, ma'am, and uh, Shesha Sai sir, of course. Thank, Thank you, you Kiran Mai, ma'am, for taking Thank out you. and just conducting the whole panel by yourself. Heartfelt gratitude to you, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, we have. We... Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Satyadi, ma'am, you are on mute. Yeah, am I audible now? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, 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 yeah. So my heart feel that thereby we have come to the end of our uh, discussion for uh, for our academic session for today. Heartiest thanks to everyone who was present today by taking out time from your busy schedules. You all have really made our effort worthwhile. Uh, uh, heart feel thanks to all the chief guests, the expert panelists, all our moderators, uh, and including Bharti ma'am and Kiran Mai ma'am. uh thank you and have a have a good evening everyone hope to see you all soon again with the next topic good night thank you abhishek thank you. thank you abhishek good night good night ma'am good night